v. The Peruvian Colony If we look at the map of Atlantis, as revealed by the deep sea soundings, we will find that it approaches at one point, by its connecting ridge, quite closely to the shore of South America, above the mouth of the Amazon, and that probably it was originally connected with it. If the population of Atlantis expanded westwardly, it naturally found its way in its ships up the magnificent valley of the Amazon and its tributaries. And, passing by the low and fever-stricken lands of Brazil, it rested not until it had reached the high, fertile, beautiful, and healthful regions of Bolivia, from which it would eventually cross the mountains into Peru. Here it would establish its outlying colonies at the terminus of its western line of advance, arrested only by the Pacific Ocean, precisely as we have seen it advancing up the valley of the Mississippi, and carrying on its mining operations on the shores of Lake Superior. Precisely as we have seen it going eastward up the Mediterranean, past the Dardanelles, and founding Arian, Hamitic, and probably Turanian colonies on the farther shores of the Black Sea and on the Caspian. This is the universal empire over which, the Hindu books tell us, Deva Nahusha was ruler, this was, the great and aggressive empire, to which Plato alludes. This was the mighty kingdom, embracing the whole of the then known world, from which the Greeks obtained their conception of the universal father of all men in King Zeus. And in this universal empire Senor Lopez must find an explanation of the similarity which, as we shall show, exists between the speech of the South American Pacific coast on the one hand, and the speech of Gaul, Ireland, England, Italy, Greece, Bactria, and Hindostan on the other. Montesino tells us that at some time near the date of the deluge, in other words, in the highest antiquity, America was invaded by a people with four leaders, named Ayermenko Topa, Ayrchaki, Ayaraka, and Ayarwisu. Ayer, says Senor Lopez, is the Sanskrit Ajar, or age, and means primitive chief, and Manko, Chaki, Aka, and Wisu, mean believers, wanderers, soldiers, husbandmen. We have here a tradition of castes like that preserved in the four tribal names of Athens. The laboring class, naturally enough in a new colony, obtained the supremacy, and its leader was named Pyromanko, revealer of Pyr, Light, Pyro, Umbrian Pyr. Do the laws which control the changes of language, by which a labial succeeds a labial, indicate that the Mero or Mero of Theopompus, the name of Atlantis, was carried by the colonists of Atlantis to South America, as the name of Old York was transplanted in a later age to New York, and became in time Peru or Peru? Was not the Nubian island of Mero, with its pyramids built by red men, a similar transplantation? And when the Hindu priest points to his sacred emblem with five projecting points upon it, and tells us that they typify Mero and the four quarters of the world, does he not refer to Atlantis and its ancient universal empire? Manco, in the names of the Peruvian colonists, it has been urged, was the same as Manu's, Manu, and the Sant Helmenico. It reminds us of Minis, Minas, etc., who are found at the beginning of so many of the Old World traditions. The Quichuas, this invading people, were originally a fair-skinned race, with blue eyes and light and even auburn hair, they had regular features, large heads, and large bodies. Their descendants are to this day an olive-skinned people, much lighter in color than the Indian tribes subjugated by them. They were a great race. Peru, as it was known to the Spaniards, held very much the same relation to the ancient Quichua civilization as England in the 16th century held to the civilization of the Empire of the Caesars. The Incas were simply an offshoot, who, descending from the mountains, subdued the rude races of the sea coast and imposed their ancient civilization upon them. The Quichua nation extended at one time over a region of country more than 2,000 miles long. This whole region, when the Spaniards arrived, was a populous and prosperous empire, complete in its civil organization, supported by an efficient system of industry, and presenting a notable development of some of the more important arts of civilized life. Baldwin's Ancient America, page 222. The companions of Pizarro found everywhere the evidences of a civilization of vast antiquity. Sica de Leon mentions it great edifices that were in ruins at Tiwanaka, an artificial hill raised on a groundwork of stone, and two stone idols, apparently made by skillful artificers, ten or twelve feet high, 
clothed in long robes. In this place, also, says De Leon, there are stones so large and so overgrown that our wonder is excited, it being incomprehensible how the power of man could have placed them where we see them. They are variously wrought, and some of them, having the form of men, must have been idols. Near the walls are many caves and excavations under the earth. But in another place, farther west, are other and greater monuments, such as large gateways with hinges, platforms, and porches, each made of a single stone. It surprised me to see these enormous gateways, made of great masses of stone, some of which were thirty feet long, fifteen high, and six thick. The capital of the Caimus of northern Peru at Gran Chimu was conquered by the Incas after a long and bloody struggle, and the capital was given up to barbaric ravage and spoliation. But its remains exist today, the marvel of the southern continent, covering not less than twenty square miles. Tombs, temples, and palaces arise on every hand, ruined but still traceable. Immense pyramidal structures, some of them half a mile in circuit, vast areas shut in by massive walls, each containing its water tank, its shops, municipal edifices, and the dwellings of its inhabitants, and each a branch of a larger organization. Prisons, furnaces for smelting metals, and almost every concomitant of civilization, existed in the ancient Chimu capital. One of the great pyramids, called the Temple of the Sun, is 812 feet long by 470 wide, and 150 high. These vast structures have been ruined for centuries, but still the work of excavation is going on. One of the centers of the ancient Quechua civilization was around Lake Titicaca. The buildings here, as throughout Peru, were all constructed of hewn stone, and had doors and windows with posts, sills, and thresholds of stone. At Culap, in northern Peru, remarkable ruins were found. They consist of a wall of wrought stones 3,600 feet long, 560 broad, and 150 high, constituting a solid mass with a level summit. On this mass was another 600 feet long, 500 broad, and 150 high, making an aggregate height of 300 feet. In it were rooms and cells which were used as tombs. Very ancient ruins, showing remains of large and remarkable edifices, were found near Huamanga, and described by Sika de Leon. The native tradition said this city was built by bearded white men, who came there long before the time of the Incas, and established a settlement. The Peruvians made large use of aqueducts, which they built with notable skill, using hewn stones and cement, and making them very substantial. One extended 450 miles across sierras and over rivers. Think of a stone aqueduct reaching from the city of New York to the state of North Carolina. The public roads of the Peruvians were most remarkable, they were built on masonry. One of the S.E. roads ran along the mountains through the whole length of the empire, from Quito to Chile, another, starting from this at Cusco, went down to the coast, and extended northward to the equator. These roads were from 20 to 25 feet wide, were macadamized with pulverized stone mixed with lime and bituminous cement, and were walled in by strong walls, more than a fathom in thickness. In many places these roads were cut for leagues through the rock, great ravines were filled up with solid masonry, rivers were crossed by suspension bridges, used here ages before their introduction into Europe. Says Baldwin, the builders of our Pacific Railroad, with their superior engineering skill and mechanical appliances, might reasonably shrink from the cost and the difficulties of such a work as this. Extending from one degree north of Quito to Cusco, and from Cusco to Chile, it was quite as long as the two Pacific railroads, and its wild route among the mountains was far more difficult. Sarmiento, describing it, said, It seems to me that if the Emperor, Charles V, should see fit to order the construction of another road like that which leads from Quito to Cusco, or that which from Cusco goes toward Chile, I certainly think B would not be able to make it, with all his power. Humboldt said, This road was marvelous, none of the Roman roads I had seen in Italy, in the south of France, or in Spain, appeared to me more imposing than this work of the ancient Peruvians. Along these great roads caravansaries were established for the accommodation of travelers. These roads were ancient in the time of the Incas. They were the work of the white, auburn-haired, bearded men from Atlantis, 
thousands of years before the time of the Incas. When Huayna Capac marched his army over the main road to invade Quito, it was so old and decayed that he found great difficulties in the passage, and he immediately ordered the necessary reconstructions. It is not necessary, in a work of this kind, to give a detailed description of the arts and civilization of the Peruvians. They were simply marvelous. Their works in cotton and wool exceeded in fineness anything known in Europe at that time. They had carried irrigation, agriculture, and the cutting of gems to a point equal to that of the old world. Their accumulations of the precious metals exceeded anything previously known in the history of the world. In the course of twenty-five years after the conquest the Spaniards sent from Peru to Spain more than eight hundred millions of dollars of gold, nearly all of it taken from the Peruvians as booty. In one of their palaces, they had an artificial garden, the soil of which was made of small pieces of fine gold, and this was artificially planted with different kinds of maize, which were of gold, their stems, leaves, and ears. Besides this, they had more than twenty sheep, llamas, with their lambs, attended by shepherds, all made of gold. In a description of one lot of golden articles, sent to Spain in 1534 by Pizarro, there is mention of, for llamas, ten statues of women of full size, and a cistern of gold, so curious that it excited the wonder of all. Can anyone read these details and declare Plato's description of Atlantis to be fabulous, simply because he tells us of the enormous quantities of gold and silver possessed by the people? Atlantis was the older country, the parent country, the more civilized country, and, doubtless, like the Peruvians, its people regarded the precious metals as sacred to their gods. And they had been accumulating them from all parts of the world for countless ages. If the story of Plato is true, there now lies beneath the waters of the Atlantic, covered, doubtless, by hundreds of feet of volcanic debris, an amount of gold and silver exceeding many times that brought to Europe from Peru, Mexico, and Central America since the time of Columbus. A treasure which, if brought to light, would revolutionize the financial values of the world. I have already shown, in the chapter upon the similarities between the civilizations of the Old and New Worlds, some of the remarkable coincidences which existed between the Peruvians and the ancient European races. I will again briefly, refer to a few of them. 1. They worshipped the sun, moon, and planets. 2. They believed in the immortality of the soul. 3. They believed in the resurrection of the body, and accordingly embalmed their dead. 4. The priest examined the entrails of the animals offered in sacrifice, and, like the Roman augurs, divined the future from their appearance. 5. They had an order of women vowed to celibacy vestal virgins nuns. And a violation of their vow was punished, in both continents, by their being buried alive. 6. They divided the year into twelve months. 7. Their enumeration was by tens, the people were divided into decades and hundreds, like the Anglo-Saxons. And the whole nation into bodies of five hundred, one thousand, and ten thousand, with a governor over each. 8. They possessed castes, and the trade of the father descended to the son, as in India. 9. They had bards and minstrels, who sung at the great festivals. 10. Their weapons were the same as those of the old world, and made after the same pattern. 11. They drank toasts and invoked blessings. 12. They built triumphal arches for their returning heroes, and strewed the road before them with leaves and flowers. 13. They used sedan chairs. 14. They regarded agriculture as the principal interest of the nation, and held great agricultural fairs and festivals for the interchange of the productions of the farmers. 15. The king opened the agricultural season by a great celebration, and, like the kings of Egypt, be put his hand to the plow, and plowed the first furrow. 16. They had an order of knighthood, in which the candidate knelt before the king. His sandals were put on by a nobleman, very much as the spurs were buckled on the European knight, he was then allowed to use the girdle or sash around the loins, corresponding to the toga virilis of the Romans, he was then crowned with flowers. According to Fernandez, the candidates wore white shirts, like the knights of the Middle Ages, with a cross embroidered in front. 17. 
There was a striking resemblance between the architecture of the Peruvians and that of some of the nations of the Old World. It is enough for me to quote Mr. Ferguson's words, that the coincidence between the buildings of the Incas and the Cyclopean remains attributed to the Pelasgians in Italy and Greece, is the most remarkable in the history of architecture. The strikingly confirm Mr. Ferguson's views. The sloping jams, the window cornice, the polygonal masonry, and other forms so closely resemble what is found in the old Pelasgic cities of Greece and Italy that it is difficult to resist the conclusion that there may be some relation between them. Even the mode of decorating their palaces and temples finds a parallel in the old world. A recent writer says, We may end by observing, what seems to have escaped Senor Lopez, that the interior of an Inca palace, with its walls covered with gold, as described by Spaniards, with its artificial golden flowers and golden beasts must have been exactly like the interior of the house of Alcanus or Menelaus. The doors were framed of gold. Where underneath the brazen floor doth glass. Silver pilasters, which with grace uphold. Lintel of silver framed. The ring was burnished gold. And dogs on each side of the door there stand. Silver and golden. I can personally testify, says Winchell, Priatomites, p. 387, that a study of ancient Peruvian pottery has constantly reminded me of forms with which we are familiar in Egyptian archaeology. Dar. Schliemann, in his excavations of the ruins of Troy, found a number of what he calls, owl-headed idols, and vases. I give specimens on page 398 and page 400. In Peru we find vases with very much the same style of face. I might pursue those parallels much farther, but it seems to me that these extraordinary coincidences must have arisen either from identity of origin or long-continued ancient intercourse. There can be little doubt that a fair-skinned, light-haired, bearded race, holding the religion which Plato says prevailed in Atlantis, carried an Atlantean civilization at an early day up the valley of the Amazon to the heights of Bolivia and Peru. Precisely as a similar emigration of Aryans went westward to the shores of the Mediterranean and Caspian, and it is very likely that these diverse migrations habitually spoke the same language. Senor Vicente Lopez, a Spanish gentleman of Montevideo, in 1872 published a work entitled Les Races Aryans in Peru, in which he attempts to prove that the great Quechua language, which the Incas imposed on their subjects over a vast extent of territory, and which is still a living tongue in Peru and Bolivia, is really a branch of the great Aryan or Indo-European speech. I quote Andrew Lang's summary of the proofs on this point. Senor Lopez's view, that the Peruvians were Aryans who left the parent stock long before the Teutonic or Hellenic races entered Europe, is supported by arguments drawn from language. From the traces of institutions, from religious beliefs, from legendary records, and artistic remains. The evidence from language is treated scientifically, and not as a kind of ingenious guessing. Senor Lopez first combats the idea that the living dialect of Peru is barbarous and fluctuating. It is not one of the casual and shifting forms of speech produced by nomad races. To which of the stages of language does this belong, the agglutinative, in which one root is fastened on to another, and a word is formed in which the constitutive elements are obviously distinct, or the inflectional. Where the auxiliary roots get worn down and are only distinguishable by the philologist? As all known Aryan tongues are inflectional, Senor Lopez may appear to contradict himself when B says that Quechua is an agglutinative Aryan language. But he quotes Mr. Max Muller's opinion that there must have been a time when the germs of Aryan tongues had not yet reached the inflectional stage, and shows that while the form of Quechua is agglutinative, as in Turanian, the roots of words are Aryan. If this be so, Quechua may be a linguistic missing link. When we first look at Quechua, with its multitude of words, beginning with who, and its great preponderance of cues, it seems almost as odd as Mexican. But many of these forms are due to a scanty alphabet, and really express familiar sounds, and many, again, result from the casual spelling of the Spaniards. We must now examine some of the forms which Aryan roots are supposed to take in Quechua. In the first place, Quechua abhors the shock of two consonants. 
Thus, a word like pylan omega in Greek would be unpleasant to the Peruvian's ear, and he says pilui, I sail. The plu, again, in pluma, a feather, is said to be found in pilu, to fly. Quichua has no v, any more than Greek has, and just as the Greeks had to spell Roman words beginning with v with o, like Valerius, omicron alpha lambda rho iota omicron, so, where Sanskrit has v, Quichua has sometimes hu. Here is a list of words in hu. Quichua, slash Sanskrit. Huakia, to call, slash vac, to speak. Huasi, a house, slash vas, to inhabit. Huaira, air, o. Ra slash va, to breathe. Wasa, the back, slash vas, to be able, puvoir. There is a Sanskrit root, kr, to act, to do, this root is found in more than 300 names of peoples and places in Southern America. Thus there are the Caribs, whose name may have the same origin as that of our old friends the Carians, and mean the Braves, and their land the home of the Braves, like Kalevala, in Finnish. The same root gives Kara, the hand, the Greek Chi Epsilon Rho, and Kali, Brave, which a person of fancy may connect with Kappa Alpha Lambda Sigma. Again, Kichua has an Alpha privative, thus A Stani means, I change a thing's place. For N I or me is the first person singular, and, added to the root of a verb, is the sign of the first person of the present indicative. For instance, can means being, and can me, or kani, is, I am. In the same way munanmi, or manani, is, I love, and apanmi, or apani, I carry. So Lord Strangford was wrong when he supposed that the last verb in me lived with the last patriot in Lithuania. Peru has stores of a grammatical form which has happily perished in Europe. It is impossible to do more than refer to the supposed Aryan roots contained in the glossary, but it may be noticed that the future of the Quechuan verb is formed in si love, manani. I shall love, manesa, and that the affixes denoting cases in the noun are curiously like the Greek prepositions. The resemblance between the Quechua and Mandan words for I or me, me, will here be observed. Very recently Dr. Rudolf Falb has announced, Nui Frey Presa, of Vienna, that he has discovered that the relation of the Quechua and Amara languages to the Aryan and Semitic tongues is very close. That, in fact, they exhibit the most astounding affinities with the Semitic tongue, and particularly the Arabic, in which tongue Dr. Falb has been skilled from his boyhood. Following, up the lines of this discovery, Dr. Falb has found, 1, a connecting link with the Aryan roots, and, 2, has ultimately arrived face to face with the surprising revelation that the Semitic roots are universally Aryan. The common stems of all the variants are found in their purest condition in Quechua and Amara, from which fact Dr. Falb derives the conclusion that the high plains of Peru and Bolivia must be regarded as the point of exit of the present human race. Since the above was written I have received a letter from Dr. Falb, dated Leipzig, April 5, 1881. Scholars will be glad to learn that Dr. Falb's great work on the relationship of the Aryan and Semitic languages to the Quechua and Amara tongues will be published in a year or two, the manuscript contains over 2,000 pages, and Dr. Falb has devoted to it 10 years of study. A work from such a source, upon so curious and important a subject, will be looked for with great interest. But it is impossible that the Quechuas and Aymaras could have passed across the wide Atlantic to Europe if there had been no stepping stone in the shape of Atlantis with its bridge-like ridges connecting the two continents. It is, however, more reasonable to suppose that the Quechuas and Aymaras were a race of emigrants from Plato's island than to think that Atlantis was populated from South America. The very traditions to which we have referred as existing among the Peruvians, that the civilized race were white and bearded, and that they entered or invaded the country, would show that civilization did not originate in Peru. But was a transplantation from abroad, and only in the direction of Atlantis can we look for a white and bearded race. In fact, kindred races, with the same arts, and speaking the same tongue in an early age of the world. Separated in Atlantis and went east and west, the one to repeat the civilization of the mother country along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, which, like a great river, may be said to flow out from the Black Sea. With the Nile as one of its tributaries, 
and along the shores of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. While the other emigration advanced up the Amazon, and created mighty nations upon its headwaters in the valleys of the Andes and on the shores of the Pacific. 6. The African Colonies Africa, like Europe and America, evidences a commingling of different stocks, the blacks are not all black, nor all woolly-haired. The Africans pass through all shades, from that of a light Berber, no darker than the Spaniard, to the deep black of the Ayalofs, between Senegal and Gambia. The traces of red men or copper-colored races are found in many parts of the continent. Pritchard divides the true Negroes into four classes, his second class is thus described. 2. Other tribes have forms and features like the European. Their complexion is black, or a deep olive, or a copper color approaching to black, while their hair, though often crisp and frizzled, is not in the least woolly. Such are the Bishari in Dainkil and Hazorda, and the darkest of the Abyssinians. The complexion and hair of the Abyssinians vary very much, their complexion ranging from almost white to dark brown or black, and their hair from straight to crisp, frizzled, and almost woolly. Not in Glidden, Types of Mankind, page 194. Some of the Nubians are copper-colored or black, with a tinge of red. Ibid, page 198. Speaking of the Barbary states, these authors further say, Ibid, p. 204. On the northern coast of Africa, between the Mediterranean and the Great Desert, including Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, and Benzazzi, there is a continuous system of highlands. Which have been included under the general term Atlas, anciently Atlantis, now the Barbary states. Throughout Barbary we encounter a peculiar group of races, subdivided into many tribes of various shades, now spread over a vast area, but which formerly had its principal and perhaps aboriginal abode along the mountain slopes of Atlas. The real name of the Berbers is Mazurk, with the article prefixed or suffixed, T Amazurk or Amazurk T, meaning free, dominant, or noble race. We have every reason to believe the Berbers existed in the remotest times, with all their essential moral and physical peculiarities. They existed in the time of Menes in the same condition in which they were discovered by Phoenician navigators previously to the foundation of Carthage. They are an indomitable, nomadic people, who, since the introduction of camels, have penetrated in considerable numbers into the desert, and even as far as Nigritia. Some of these clans are white, others black, with woolly hair. Speaking of the Barbary Moors, Pritchard says. Their figure and stature are nearly the same as those of the southern Europeans, and their complexion, if darker, is only so in proportion to the higher temperature of the country. It displays great varieties. Jackson says. The men of Temsena and Shoya are of a strong, robust make, and of a copper color, the women are beautiful. The women of Fez are fair as the Europeans, but hair and eyes always dark. The women of Makinas are very beautiful, and have the red and white complexion of English women. Spix and Martins, the German travelers, depict the Moors as follows. A high forehead, an oval countenance, large, speaking, black eyes, shaded by arched and strong eyebrows, a thin, rather long, but not too pointed nose, rather broad lips. Meeting in an acute angle, brownish-yellow complexion, thick, smooth, and black hair, and a stature greater than the middle height. Hodgson states. The Tuareks are a white people, of the Berber race, the Mozabiaks are a remarkably white people, and mixed with the Bedouin Arabs. The Wadragans and Wurjlans are of a dark bronze, with woolly hair. The Fulas, Fulb, Singh. Pulo, Felani, or Falada, are a people of West and Central Africa. It is the opinion of modern travelers that the Fulas are destined to become the dominant people of Negroland. In language, appearance, and history they present striking differences from the neighboring tribes, to whom they are superior in intelligence, but inferior, according to Garth, in physical development. Galbury describes them as, robust and courageous, of a reddish-black color, with regular features, hair longer and less woolly than that of the common Negroes, and high mental capacity. Gar. Barth found great local differences in their physical characteristics, as Bowen describes the Fulas of Bamba as being some black, 
some almost white, and many of a mulatto color, varying from dark to very bright. Their features and skulls were cast in the European mold. They have a tradition that their ancestors were whites, and certain tribes call themselves white men. They came from Timbuktu, which lies to the north of their present location. The Nubians and Fulas are classed as Mediterraneans. They are not black, but yellowish brown, or red brown. The hair is not woolly but curly, and sometimes quite straight. It is either dark brown or black, with a fuller growth of beard than the Negroes. The oval face gives them a Mediterranean type. Their noses are prominent, their lips not puffy, and their languages have no connection with the tongues of the Negroes proper. American Cyclopedia, Art. Ethnology, page 759. The Cromlex, Dolmens, of Algeria, was the subject of an address made by General Faydair at the Brussels International Congress. He considers these structures to be simply sepulchral monuments, and, after examining five or six thousand of them, maintains that the dolmens of Africa and of Europe were all constructed by the same race. During their emigration from the shores of the Baltic to the southern coast of the Mediterranean. The author does not, however, attempt to explain the existence of these monuments in other countries, Hindustan, for instance, and America. In Africa, he says, Cromlechs are called tombs of the idolaters, the idolaters being neither Romans, nor Christians, nor Phoenicians, but some antique race. He regards the Berbers as the descendants of the primitive dolmen builders. Certain Egyptian monuments tell of invasions of Lower Egypt 1,500 years before our era by blonde tribes from the west. The bones found in the Cromlechs are those of a large and dolicocephalous race. General Faderb gives the average stature, including the women, at 1.65 or 1.74 meter, while the average stature of French carabiners is only 1.65 meter. He did not find a single brachycephalus skull. The profiles indicated great intelligence. The Egyptian documents already referred to call the invaders Tamahu, which must have come from the invaders' own language, as it is not Egyptian. The Tuaregs of the present day may be regarded as the best representatives of the Tamahus. They are of lofty stature, have blue eyes, and cling to the custom of bearing long swords, to be wielded by both hands. In Sudan, on the banks of the Niger, dwells a Negro tribe ruled by a royal family, Masses, who are of rather fair complexion, and claim descent from white men. Masses is perhaps the same as Mashash, which occurs in the Egyptian documents applied to the Tamahus. The Masses wear the hair in the same fashion as the Tamahus, and General Faderb is inclined to think that they too are the descendants of the Dolmen Builders. These people, according to my theory, were colonists from Atlantis, colonists of three different races, white, yellow, and sunburnt or red. 7. The Irish Colonies from Atlantis we have seen that beyond question Spain and France owed a great part of their population to Atlantis. Let us turn now to Ireland. We would naturally expect, in view of the geographical position of the country, to find Ireland colonized at an early day by the overflowing population of Atlantis. And, in fact, the Irish annals tell us that their island was settled prior to the flood. In their oldest legends an account is given of three Spanish fishermen who were driven by contrary winds on the coast of Ireland before the deluge. After these came the Formorians, who were led into the country prior to the deluge by the Lady Banba, or Caesar, her maiden name was Acherny, or Burba, she was accompanied by fifty maidens and three men Bith, Ladra, and Fintan. Ladra was their conductor, who was the first buried in Hibernia. That ancient book, the C.I.N. of Dromsnecta, is quoted in the Book of Balamote as authority for this legend. The Irish annals speak of the Formorians as a warlike race, who, according to the Annals of Clonmacnoise, were a sept descended from Cham, the son of Ney, and lived by piracy and spoil of other nations. And were in those days very troublesome to the whole world. Were not these the inhabitants of Atlantis, who, according to Plato, carried their arms to Egypt and Athens, and whose subsequent destruction has been attributed to divine vengeance invoked by their arrogance and oppressions. The Formorians were from Atlantis. They were called Fomhoraic, Fomhoraic Afraic, and Formorag, 
which has been rendered into English as Formorians. They possessed ships, and the uniform representation is that they came, as the name Farmerega Freic indicated, from Africa. But in that day Africa did not mean the continent of Africa, as we now understand it. Major Wilford, in the eighth volume of the Asiatic Researches, has pointed out that Africa comes from Apar, Afar, Apra, or Aparika, terms used to signify the West, just as we now speak of the Asiatic world as the East. When, therefore, the Formorians claimed to come from Africa, they simply meant that they came from the West in other words, from Atlantis for there was no other country except America west of them. They possessed Ireland from so early a period that by some of the historians they are spoken of as the Aborigines of the country. The first invasion of Ireland, subsequent to the coming of the Formorians, was led by a chief called Partholan, his people are known in the Irish annals as Partholan's people. They were also probably Atlanteans. They were from Spain. A British prince, Gulguntius, or Germond, encountered off the Hebrides a fleet of thirty ships, filled with men and women, led by one Partholian, who told him they were from Spain, and seeking some place to colonize. The British prince directed him to Ireland. De Antique Eoric Cantab. Spain in that day was the land of the Iberians, the Basques, that is to say, the Atlanteans. The Formorians defeated Partholan's people, killed Partholan, and drove the invaders out of the country. The Formorians were a civilized race, they had a fleet of sixty ships and a strong army. The next invader of their dominions was Nimhid. He captured one of their fortifications, but it was retaken by the Formorians under Mork. Nimhid was driven out of the country, and the Atlanteans continued in undisturbed possession of the island for four hundred years more. Then came the Firbalgs. They conquered the whole island, and divided it into five provinces. They held possession of the country for only thirty-seven years, when they were overthrown by the Tuatha Danans, a people more advanced in civilization. So much so that when their king, Nuada, lost his hand in battle, Craden, the artificer, we are told, put a silver hand upon him, the fingers of which were capable of motion. This great race ruled the country for 197 years, they were overthrown by an immigration from Spain, probably of Basques, or Iberians, or Atlanteans, the sons of Milad, or Milesius, who possessed a large fleet and a strong army. This last invasion took place about the year 1700 BC, so that the invasion of Nimhid must have occurred about the year 2334 BC. While we will have to assign a still earlier date for the coming of Partholan's people, and an earlier still for the occupation of the country by the Formorians from the west. In the Irish historic tales called Catha. Or battles, as given by the learned Okery, a record is preserved of a real battle which was fought between the Tuathadadanans and the Fir Balgs, from which it appears that these two races spoke the same language. And that they were intimately connected with the Formorians. As the armies drew near together the Firbalg sent out Breas, one of their great chiefs, to reconnoitre the camp of the strangers, the Tuathadadanans appointed one of their champions, named Srang, to meet the emissary of the enemy. The two warriors met and talked to one another over the tops of their shields, and each was delighted to find that the other spoke the same language. A battle followed, in which Nunda, king of the Firbalgs, was slain, Breas succeeded him. He encountered the hostility of the bards, and was compelled to resign the crown. He went to the court of his father-in-law, Elaith, a Formorian sea-king or pirate. Not being well received, he repaired to the camp of Baylor of the Evil Eye, a Formorian chief. The Formorian headquarters seemed to have been in the Hebrides. Breas and Baylor collected a vast army and navy and invaded Ireland, but were defeated in a great battle by the Tuathadadanans. These particulars would show the race identity of the Firbalg and Tuathadadanans. And also their intimate connection, if not identity with, the Formorians. The Tuathadadanans seem to have been a civilized people. Besides possessing ships and armies and working in the metals, they had an organized body of surgeons, whose duty it was to attend upon the wounded in battle. And they had also a bardic or druid class, to preserve the history of the country and the deeds of kings and heroes. 
According to the ancient books of Ireland the race known as Partholan's people, the Nemedians, the Firbolgs, the Tuathididanans, and the Milesians were all descended from two brothers, sons of Magog, son of Japheth, son of Noah, who escaped from the catastrophe which destroyed his country. Thus all these races were Atlantean. They were connected with the African colonies of Atlantis, the Berbers, and with the Egyptians. The Milesians lived in Egypt, they were expelled thence. They stopped a while in Crete, then in Scythia, then they settled in Africa, see Mac Gogan's History of Ireland, page 57, at a place called Gethuli or Getulia, and lived there during eight generations, say 250 years. Then they entered Spain, where they built Bragantia, or Braganza, named after their king Briagan, they dwelt in Spain a considerable time. Milesius, a descendant of Briagan, went on an expedition to Egypt, took part in a war against the Ethiopians, married the king's daughter, Skoda, he died in Spain, but his people soon after conquered Ireland. On landing on the coast they offered sacrifices to Neptune or Poseidon, the god of Atlantis. Ibid, page 58. The Book of Genesis, chapter 10, gives us the descendants of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We are told that the sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. We are then given the names of the descendants of Gomer and Javan, but not of Magog. Josephus says the sons of Magog were the Scythians. The Irish annals take up the genealogy of Magog's family where the Bible leaves it. The Book of Invasions, the Cyan of Dromsnecta, claims that these Scythians were the Phoenicians. And we are told that a branch of this family were driven out of Egypt in the time of Moses, he wandered through Africa for forty-two years, and passed by the lake of Salivae to the altars of the Philistines. And between Rizicata and the mountains Azure, and he came by the river Monlon, and by the sea to the pillars of Hercules, and through the Tuscan Sea, and he made for Spain, and dwelt there many years, and he increased and multiplied. And his people were multiplied. From all these facts it appears that the population of Ireland came from the west. And not from Asia that it was one of the many waves of population flowing out from the island of Atlantis and herein we find the explanation of that problem which has puzzled the Aryan scholars. As Ireland is farther from the Punjab than Persia, Greece, Rome, or Scandinavia, it would follow that the Celtic wave of migration must have been the earliest sent out from the Sanskrit center. But it is now asserted by Professor Schleicher and others that the Celtic tongue shows that it separated from the Sanskrit original tongue later than the others, and that it is more closely allied to the Latin than any other Aryan tongue. This is entirely inexplicable upon any theory of an Eastern origin of the Indo-European races, but very easily understood if we recognize the Aryan and Celtic migrations as going out about the same time from the Atlantean fountainhead. There are many points confirmatory of this belief. In the first place, the civilization of the Irish dates back to a vast antiquity. We have seen their annals laying claim to an immigration from the direction of Atlantis prior to the Deluge, with no record that the people of Ireland were subsequently destroyed by the Deluge. From the Formorians, who came before the Deluge, to the Milesians, who came from Spain in the historic period, the island was continuously inhabited. This demonstrates, 1 that these legends did not come from Christian sources, as the Bible record was understood in the old time to imply a destruction of all who lived before the flood except Noah and his family. 2. It confirms our view that the deluge was a local catastrophe, and did not drown the whole human family. 3. That the coming of the Formorians having been before the deluge, that great cataclysm was of comparatively recent date, to wit, since the settlement of Ireland. And, 4 that as the deluge was a local catastrophe, it must have occurred somewhere not far from Ireland to have come to their knowledge. A rude people could scarcely have heard in that day of a local catastrophe occurring in the heart of Asia. There are many evidences that the Old World recognized Ireland as possessing a very ancient civilization. In the Sanskrit books it is referred to as Hiranya, the island of the sun, to wit, of sun worship. In other words, as preeminently the center of that religion which was shared by all the ancient races of Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. 
It is believed that Ireland was the Garden of Phoebus of the Western mythologists. The Greeks called Ireland the Sacred Isle and Ogygia. Nor can any one, says Camden, conceive why they should call it Ogygia, unless, perhaps, from its antiquity, for the Greeks called nothing Ogygia unless what was extremely ancient. We have seen that Ogyges was connected by the Greek legends with a first deluge, and that Ogyges was a quite mythical personage, lost in the night of ages. It appears, as another confirmation of the theory of the Atlantis origin of these colonies, that their original religion was sun worship, this, as was the case in other countries, became subsequently overlaid with idol worship. In the reign of King Tigermas the worship of idols was introduced. The priests constituted the order of Druids. Naturally many analogies have been found to exist between the beliefs and customs of the Druids and the other religions which were drawn from Atlantis. We have seen in the chapter on sun worship how extensive this form of religion was in the Atlantean days, both in Europe and America. It would appear probable that the religion of the Druids passed from Ireland to England and France. The metempsychosis or transmigration of souls was one of the articles of their belief long before the time of Pythagoras, it had probably been drawn from the storehouse of Atlantis, whence it passed to the Druids, the Greeks, and the Hindus. The Druids had a Pontifex Maximus to whom they yielded entire obedience. Here again we see a practice which extended to the Phoenicians, Egyptians, Hindus, Peruvians, and Mexicans. The Druids of Gaul and Britain offered human sacrifices, while it is claimed that the Irish Druids did not. This would appear to have been a corrupt aftergrowth imposed upon the earlier and purer sacrifice of fruits and flowers known in Atlantis, and due in part to greater cruelty and barbarism in their descendants. Hence we find it practiced in degenerate ages on both sides of the Atlantic. The Irish Druidical rites manifested themselves principally in sun worship. Their chief god was Bel or Baal the same worshipped by the Phoenicians the god of the sun. The Irish name for the sun, Grian, is, according to Virgil, one of the names of Apollo another sun god, Grinius. Sun worship continued in Ireland down to the time of Asti. Patrick, and some of its customs exist among the peasantry of that country to this day. We have seen that among the Peruvians, Romans, and other nations, on a certain day all fires were extinguished throughout the kingdom, and a new fire kindled at the chief temple by the sun's rays, from which the people obtained their fire for the coming year. In Ireland the same practice was found to exist. A piece of land was set apart, where the four provinces met, in the present county of Meath, here, at a palace called Tlacta, the divine fire was kindled. Upon the night of what is now All Saints' Day the Druids assembled at this place to offer sacrifice, and it was established, under heavy penalties, that no fire should be kindled except from this source. On the 1st of May a convocation of Druids was held in the royal palace of the King of Connaught, and two fires were lit, between which cattle were driven, as a preventive of murrain and other pestilential disorders. This was called Beltin, or the Day of Bell's Fire. And unto this day the Irish call the first day of May, La Bultin, which signifies, the day of Bell's fire. The celebration in Ireland of Asti. John's Eve by watchfires is a relic of the ancient sun worship of Atlantis. The practice of driving cattle through the fire continued for a long time, and Kelly mentions in his, Folklore, that in Northamptonshire, in England, a calf was sacrificed in one of these fires to, stop the murrain, during the present century. Fires are still lighted in England and Scotland as well as Ireland for superstitious purposes, so that the people of Great Britain, it may be said, are still in some sense in the midst of the ancient sun worship of Atlantis. We find among the Irish of today many oriental customs. The game of jacks, or throwing up five pebbles and catching them on the back of the hand, was known in Rome. The Irish keen, Kaoan, or the lament over the dead, may still be heard in Algeria and Upper Egypt, even as Herodotus heard it chanted by the Libyan women. The same practice existed among the Egyptians, Etruscans, and Romans. The Irish wakes are identical with the funeral feasts of the Greeks, Etruscans, and Romans. Cusack's History of Ireland, page 141. The Irish custom of saying, God bless you, when one sneezes, is a very ancient practice. 
It was known to the Romans, and referred, it is said, to a plague in the remote past, whose first symptom was sneezing. We find many points of resemblance between the customs of the Irish and those of the Hindu. The practice of the creditor fasting at the doorstep of his debtor until B is paid, is known to both countries, the kindly, God save you, is the same as the Eastern, God be gracious to you, my son. The reverence for the wren in Ireland and Scotland reminds us of the Oriental and Greek respect for that bird. The practice of pilgrimages, fasting, bodily macerations, and devotion to holy wells and particular places, extends from Ireland to India. All these things speak of a common origin, this fact has been generally recognized, but it has always been interpreted that the Irish camp, from the east, and were in fact a migration of Hindus. There is not the slightest evidence to sustain this theory. The Hindus have never within the knowledge of man sent out colonies or fleets for exploration, but there is abundant evidence, on the other hand, of migrations from Atlantis eastward. And how could the Sanskrit writings have preserved maps of Ireland, England, and Spain, giving the shape and outline of their coasts, and their very names? And yet have preserved no memory of the expeditions or colonizations by which they acquired that knowledge? Another proof of our theory is found in the Round Towers of Ireland. Attempts have been made to show, by Diar. Petrie and others, that these extraordinary structures are of modern origin, and were built by the Christian priests, in which to keep their church plate. But it is shown that the Annals of Ulster mention the destruction of 57 of them by an earthquake in AD 448, and Geraldus Cambrensis shows that Loch Nee was created by an inundation, or sinking of the Laud, in AD 65, and that in his day the fishermen could see the round towers of other days in the waves beneath them shining. Moreover, we find Diodorus Siculus, in a well-known passage, referring to Ireland, and describing it as, an island in the ocean over against Gaul, to the north, and not inferior in size to Sicily. The soil of which is so fruitful that they mow there twice in the year. He mentions the skill of their harpers, their sacred groves, and their singular temples of round form. We find similar structures in America, Sardinia, and India. The remains of similar round towers are very abundant in the Orkneys and Shetlands. They have been supposed by some, says Sir John Lubbock, to be Scandinavian, but no similar buildings exist in Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, so that this style of architecture is no doubt anterior to the arrival of the Northmen. I give above a picture of the berg or brock of the little island of Musa, in the Shetlands. It is circular in form, 41 feet in height, open at the top. The central space is 20 feet in diameter, the walls about 14 feet thick at the base, and 8 feet at the top. They contain a staircase, which leads to the top of the building. Similar structures are found in the island of Sardinia. In New Mexico and Colorado the remains of round towers are very abundant. The illustration below represents one of these in the valley of the Mancos, in the southwestern corner of Colorado. A model of it is to be found in the Smithsonian Collection at Washington. The tower stands at present, in its ruined condition, 20 feet high. It will be seen that it resembles the towers of Ireland, not only in its circular form but also in the fact that its doorway is situated at some distance from the ground. It will not do to say that the resemblance between these prehistoric and singular towers, in countries so far apart as Sardinia, Ireland, Colorado, and India, is due to an accidental coincidence. It might as well be argued that the resemblance between the roots of the various Indo-European languages was also due to accidental coincidence, and did not establish any similarity of origin. In fact, we might just as well go back to the theory of the philosophers of 150 years ago, and say that the resemblance between the fossil forms in the rocks and the living forms upon them did not indicate relationship. Or prove that the fossils were the remains of creatures that had once lived, but that it was simply a way nature had of working out extraordinary coincidences in a kind of joke. A sort of, plastic power in nature, as it was called. We find another proof that Ireland was settled by the people of Atlantis in the fact that traditions long existed among the Irish peasantry of a land in the far west. And that this belief was especially found among the posterity of the Tuatha de Danans, 
whose connection with the Formorians we have shown. The Abbé Brasser de Bourbourg, in a note to his translation of the Popol Vuh, says. There is an abundance of legends and traditions concerning the passage of the Irish into America. And their habitual communication with that continent many centuries before the time of Columbus. We should bear in mind that Ireland was colonized by the Phoenicians, or by people of that race. An Irish saint named Vigil, who lived in the 8th century, was accused to Pope Zachary of having taught heresies on the subject of the Antipodes. At first he wrote to the Pope in reply to the charge, but afterward he went to Rome in person to justify himself, and there be proved to the Pope that the Irish had been accustomed to communicate with a transatlantic world. This fact, says Baldwin, seems to have been preserved in the records of the Vatican. The Irish annals preserve the memory of St. Brendan of Clonfort, and his remarkable voyage to a land in the West, made A.D. 545. His early youth was passed under the care of St. Ida, a lady of the princely family of the Decii. When he was five years old he was placed under the care of Bishop Urcus. Kerry was his native home, the blue waves of the Atlantic washed its shores. The coast was full of traditions of a wonderful land in the west. He went to see the venerable Saint Enda, the first abbot of Aaron, for counsel. He was probably encouraged in the plan he had formed of carrying the gospel to this distant land. He proceeded along the coast of Mayo, inquiring as he went for traditions of the western continent. On his return to Kerry he decided to set out on the important expedition. St. Brendan's Hill still bears his name. And from the bay at the foot of this lofty eminence be sailed for the far west. Directing his course toward the southwest, with a few faithful companions, in a well-provisioned bark, he came, after some rough and dangerous navigation, to calm seas, where, without aid of oar or sail, he was borne along for many weeks. He had probably entered upon the same great current which Columbus travelled nearly one thousand years later, and which extends from the shores of Africa and Europe to America. He finally reached land. He proceeded inland until he came to a large river flowing from east to west, supposed by some to be the Ohio. After an absence of seven years he returned to Ireland, and lived not only to tell of the marvels he had seen, but to found a college of three thousand monks at Clonfort. There are eleven Latin MSS. In the Bibliothèque Imperiale at Paris of this legend, the dates of which vary from the eleventh to the fourteenth century, but all of them anterior to the time of Columbus. The fact that is t. Brendan sailed in search of a country in the West cannot be doubted, and the legends which guided him were probably the traditions of Atlantis among a people whose ancestors had been derived directly or at second hand from that country. This land was associated in the minds of the peasantry with traditions of Edenic happiness and beauty. Miss Eleanor C. Donnelly, of Philadelphia, has referred to it in her poem, The Sleeper's Sail, where the starving boy dreams of the pleasant and plentiful land. Mother, I've been on the cliffs out yonder. Straining my eyes o'er the breakers free. To the lovely spot where the sun was setting. Setting and sinking into the sea. The sky was full of the fairest colors. Pink and purple and poly green. With great soft masses of gray and amber. And great bright rifts of gold between. And all the birds that way were flying. Heron and curlew overhead. With a mighty eagle westward floating. Every plume in their pinions red. And then I saw it, the fairy city. Far away o'er the waters deep. Towers and castles and chapels glowing. Like blessed dreams that we see in sleep. What is its name? Be still, Akushla. Thy hair is wet with the mists, my boy. Thou hast looked perchance on the Tirnain Oge. Land of eternal youth and joy. Out of the sea, when the sun is setting. It rises, golden and fair to view. No trace of ruin, or change of sorrow. No sign of age where all is new. Forever sunny, forever blooming. Nor cloud nor frost can touch that spot. Where the happy people are ever roaming. The bitter pangs of the past forgot. This is the Greek story of Elysian, these are the Elysian fields of the Egyptians. 
These are the gardens of the Hesperides, this is the region in the west to which the peasant of Brittany looks from the shores of Cape Raz, this is Atlantis. The starving child seeks to reach this blessed land in a boat and is drowned. High on the cliffs the lighthouse keeper caught the sound of a piercing scream. Low in her hut the lonely widow moaned in the maze of a troubled dream and saw in her sleep a seaman ghostly with seaweeds clinging in his hair into her room, all wet and dripping. A drowned boy on his bosom bare over death sea on a bridge of silver. The child to his father's arms had passed. Heaven was nearer than Tirnainoge. And the golden city was reached at last. 8. The oldest son of Noah. That eminent authority, Dyar. Max Muller, says, in his, Lectures on the Science of Religion. If we confine ourselves to the Asiatic continent, with its important peninsula of Europe, we find that in the vast desert of drifting human speech three, and only three. Oases have been formed in which, before the beginning of all history, language became permanent and traditional assumed, in fact, a new character. A character totally different from the original character of the floating and constantly varying speech of human beings. These three oases of language are known by the name of Turanian, Aryan, and Semitic. In these three centers, more particularly in the Aryan and Semitic, language ceased to be natural. Its growth was arrested, and it became permanent, solid, petrified, or, if you like, historical speech. I have always maintained that this centralization and traditional conservation of language could only have been the result of religious and political influences. And I now mean to show that we really have clear evidence of three independent settlements of religion the Turanian, the Aryan, and the Semitic concomitantly with the three great settlements of language. There can be no doubt that the Aryan and another branch, which Muller calls Semitic, but which may more properly be called Hamitic, radiated from Noah. It is a question yet to be decided whether the Turanian or Mongolian is also a branch of the Noahic or Atlantean stock. To quote again from Max Muller. If it can only be proved that the religions of the Aryan nations are united by the same bonds of a real relationship which have enabled us to treat their languages as so many varieties of the same type and so also of the Semitic the field thus opened is vast enough. And its careful clearing and cultivation will occupy several generations of scholars. And this original relationship, I believe, can be proved. Names of the principal deities, words also expressive of the most essential elements of religion, such as prayer, sacrifice, altar, spirit, law, and faith, have been preserved among the Aryan and among the Semitic nations. And these relies admit of one explanation only. After that, a comparative study of the Turanian religions may be approached with better hope of success. For that there was not only a primitive Aryan and a primitive Semitic religion, but likewise a primitive Turanian religion, before each of these primeval races was broken up and became separated in language, worship and national sentiment, admits. I believe, of little doubt. There was a period during which the ancestors of the Semitic family had not yet been divided, whether in language or in religion. That period transcends the recollection of every one of the Semitic races, in the same way as neither Hindus, Greeks, nor Romans have any recollection of the time when they spoke a common language. And worshipped their father in heaven by a name that was as yet neither Sanskrit, nor Greek, nor Latin. But I do not hesitate to call this prehistoric period historical in the best sense of the word. It was a real period, because, unless it was real, all the realities of the Semitic languages and the Semitic religions, such as we find them after their separation, would be unintelligible. Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic point to a common source as much as Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. And unless we can bring ourselves to doubt that the Hindus, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Teutons derived the worship of their principal deity from their common Aryan sanctuary, we shall not be able to deny that there was likewise a primitive religion of the whole Semitic race, and that El, the strong one in heaven, was invoked by the ancestors of all the Semitic races before there were Babylonians in Babylon. Phoenicians in Sidon and Tyrus before there were Jews in Mesopotamia or Jerusalem. The evidence of the Semitic is the same as that of the Aryan languages, the conclusion cannot be different. 
these three classes of religion are not to be mistaken as little as the three classes of language, the Turanian, the Semitic, and the Aryan. They mark three events in the most ancient history of the world, events which have determined the whole fate of the human race, and of which we ourselves still feel the consequences in our language, in our thoughts, and in our religion. We have seen that all the evidence points to the fact that this original seat of the Phoenician Hebrew family was in Atlantis. The great god of the so-called Semites was El, the Strong One, from whose name comes the biblical names Bethel, the House of God, Hael, the Strong One, Elohim, the gods, Eloah, God. And from the same name is derived the Arabian name of God, Allah. Another evidence of the connection between the Greeks, Phoenicians, Hebrews, and Atlanteans is shown in the name of Adonis. The Greeks tell us that Adonis was the lover of Aphrodite, or Venus, who was the offspring of Uranus, she came out of the sea, Uranus was the father of Kronos, and the grandfather of Poseidon, king of Atlantis. Now we find Adonai in the Old Testament used exclusively as the name of Jehovah, while among the Phoenicians Adonai was the supreme deity. In both cases the root Ad is probably a reminiscence of Atlantis. There seem to exist similar connections between the Egyptian and the Turanian mythology. The great god of Egypt was Neph or Number, the chief god of the Samoyeds is Number. And Max Muller established an identity between the number of the Samoyeds and the god Yamala of the Finns, and probably with the name of the god Naum of the Thibetians. That mysterious people, the Etruscans, who inhabited part of Italy, and whose bronze implements agreed exactly in style and workmanship with those which we think were derived from Atlantis, were, it is now claimed, a branch of the Turanian family. At a recent meeting of the English Philological Society great interest was excited by a paper on Etruscan numerals, by the Reverend Isaac Taylor. He stated that the long-sought key to the Etruscan language had at last been discovered. Two dice had been found in a tomb, with their six faces marked with words instead of pips. He showed that these words were identical with the first six digits in the Altaic branch of the Turanian family of speech. Guided by this clue, it was easy to prove that the grammar and vocabulary of the 3000 Etruscan inscriptions were also Altaic. The words denoting kindred, the pronouns, the conjugations, and the declensions, corresponded closely to those of the Tartar tribes of Siberia. The Etruscan mythology proved to be essentially the same as that of the Kalevala, the great Finnic epic. According to Lenormand, Ancient History of the East, Volume 1, page 62, Volume 2, page 23, the early contests between the Aryans and the Turanians are represented in the Iranian traditions as contests between hostile brothers. The Ugro Finnish races must, according to all appearances, be looked upon as a branch, earlier detached than the others from the Japhetic stem. If it be true that the first branch originating from Atlantis was the Turanian, which includes the Chinese and Japanese. Then we have derived from Atlantis all the building and metalworking races of men who have proved themselves capable of civilization. And we may, therefore, divide mankind into two great classes, those capable of civilization, derived from Atlantis, and those essentially and at all times barbarian, who hold no blood relationship with the people of Atlantis. Humboldt is sure that some connection existed between ancient Ethiopia and the elevated plain of Central Asia. There were invasions which reached from the shores of Arabia into China. An Arabian sovereign, Shamarayarish, Abu Karib, is described by Hamza, Nawari, and others as a powerful ruler and conqueror, who carried his arms successfully far into Central Asia, he occupied Samarkand and invaded China. He erected an edifice at Samarkand, bearing an inscription, in Himyarite or Kushite characters, in the name of God, Shamarayarish has erected this edifice to the sun, his lord. Baldwin's, Prehistoric Nations, page 110. These invasions must have been prior to 1518 BC. Charles Walcott Brooks read a paper before the California Academy of Sciences, in which B says. According to Chinese annals, Taikofoki, the great stranger king, ruled the kingdom of China. In pictures he is represented with two small horns, like those associated with the representations of Moses. He and his successor are said to have introduced into China picture writing, 
like that in use in Central America at the time of the Spanish conquest. He taught the motions of the heavenly bodies, and divided time into years and months. B also introduced many other useful arts and sciences. Now, there has been found at Copan, in Central America, a figure strikingly like the Chinese symbol of Foki, with his two horns. And, in like manner, there is a close resemblance between the Central American and the Chinese figures representing earth and heaven. Either one people learned from the other, or both acquired these forms from a common source. Many physico-geographical facts favor the hypothesis that they were derived in very remote ages from America, and that from China they passed to Egypt. Chinese records say that the progenitors of the Chinese race came from across the sea. The two small horns of Tycho Foki and Moses are probably a reminiscence of Baal. We find the horns of Baal represented in the remains of the Bronze Age of Europe. Bell sometimes wore a tiara with his bull's horns. The tiara was the crown subsequently worn by the Persian kings, and it became, in time, the symbol of papal authority. The Atlanteans having domesticated cattle, and discovered their vast importance to humanity, associated the bull and cow with religious ideas, as revealed in the oldest hymns of the Arians and the cow-headed idols of Troy. A representation of one of which is shown on the preceding page. Upon the head of their great god Baal they placed the horns of the bull, and these have descended in popular imagination to the spirit of evil of our day. Burns says. O thou! Whatever title suit thee. Ald horny, Satan, Nick, or Cludy. Cludy is derived from the cleft hoof of a cow, while the Scotch name for a bull is Bill, a corruption, probably, of Bell. Less than 200 years ago it was customary to sacrifice a bull on the 25th of August to the god Mori, and his devilins, on the island of Innes Marie, Scotland. The Past and the Present, page 165. The trident of Poseidon has degenerated into the pitchfork of Beelzebub. And when we cross the Atlantic, we find in America the horns of Baal reappearing in a singular manner. The first cut on page 429 represents an idol of the Maquis of New Mexico, the head is very bull-like. In the next figure we have a representation of the war god of the Dakotas, with something like a trident in his hand. While the next illustration is taken from Zarate's, Peru, and depicts the god of a degrading worship. He is very much like the traditional conception of the European devil horns, pointed ears, wings, and poker. Compare this last figure, from Peru, with the representation on page 430 of a Greek siren, one of those cruel monsters who, according to Grecian mythology, sat in the midst of bones and blood, tempting men to ruin by their sweet music. Here we have the same bird-like legs and claws as in the Peruvian demon. Herein shows that a great overland commerce extended in ancient times between the Black Sea and Great Mongolia. He mentions a temple of the sun, and a great caravansary in the desert of Gobi. Arminius Vambury, in his Travels in Central Asia, describes very important ruins near the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, at a place called Gomishtip. And connected with these are the remains of a great wall which he followed ten geographical miles. He found a vast aqueduct 150 miles long, extending to the Persian mountains. He reports abundant ruins in all that country, extending even to China. The early history of China indicates contact with a superior race. Fahai, who is regarded as a demigod, founded the Chinese Empire 2852 BC. He introduced cattle, taught the people how to raise them, and taught the art of writing. American Cyclopedia, Art. China. He might have invented his alphabet, but he did not invent the cattle. He must have got them from some nation who, during many centuries of civilization, had domesticated them. And from what nation was he more likely to have obtained them than from the Atlanteans, whose colonies we have seen reached his borders, and whose armies invaded his territory? He instituted the ceremony of marriage. Ibid. This also was an importation from a civilized land. His successor, Xin Neng, during a reign of 140 years, introduced agriculture and medical science. The next emperor, Huang Tiai, is believed to have invented weapons, wagons, ships, clocks, 
and musical instruments, and to have introduced coins, weights, and measures. Ibid. As these various inventions in all other countries have been the result of slow development, running through many centuries, or are borrowed from some other more civilized people. It is certain that no emperor of China ever invented them all during a period of 164 years. These, then, were also importations from the West. In fact, the Chinese themselves claimed to have invaded China in the early days from the Northwest. And their first location is placed by Winchell near Lake Balkat, a short distance east of the Caspian, where we have already seen Aryan Atlantean colonies planted at an early day. The third successor of Fahai, Tiku, established schools, and was the first to practice polygamy. In 2357 his son Yao ascended the throne, and it is from his reign that the regular historical records begin. A great flood, which occurred in his reign, has been considered synchronous and identical with the Noah Sheikh deluge, and to Yao is attributed the merit of having successfully battled against the waters. There can be no question that the Chinese themselves, in their early legends, connected their origin with a people who were destroyed by water in a tremendous convulsion of the earth. Associated with this event was a divine personage called Nyovie, Noah. Sir William Jones says. The Chinese believe the earth to have been wholly covered with water, which, in works of undisputed authenticity, they describe as flowing abundantly. Then subsiding and separating the higher from the lower ages of mankind. That this division of time, from which their poetical history begins, just preceded the appearance of F.O. High on the mountains of Qin. Discourse on the Chinese, Asiatic Researches, Volume 2, page 376. The following history of this destruction of their ancestors vividly recalls to us the convulsion depicted in the Chaldean and American legends. The pillars of heaven were broken, the earth shook to its very foundations. The heavens sunk lower toward the north, the sun, the moon, and the stars changed their motions, the earth fell to pieces, and the waters enclosed within its bosom burst forth with violence and overflowed it. Man having rebelled against heaven, the system of the universe was totally disordered. The sun was eclipsed, the planets altered their course, and the grand harmony of nature was disturbed. A learned Frenchman, M. Therrien de la Couiry, member of the Asiatic Society of Paris, has just published a work, 1880, in which he demonstrates the astonishing fact that the Chinese language is clearly related to the Chaldean and that both the Chinese characters and the cuneiform alphabet are degenerate descendants of an original hieroglyphical alphabet. The same signs exist for many words, while numerous words are very much alike. M. de la Couiry gives a table of some of these similarities, from which I quote as follows. English, slash Chinese, slash Chaldi. To shine, slash mut, slash mull. To die, slash mut, slash mit. Book slash king slash kin. Cloth slash sick slash sick. Right hand slash zek slash zag. Hero slash tan slash dun. Earth slash kien kai slash kienji. Cow slash lube slash lu, lup. Brick slash ku slash ku. This surprising discovery brings the Chinese civilization still nearer to the Mediterranean headquarters of the races, and increases the probability that the arts of China were of Atlantean origin. And that the name of Nai Hong Tiai, or Nai Kordi, the founder of Chinese civilization, may be a reminiscence of Nakunta, the chief of the gods, as recorded in the Susian texts, and this, in turn, a recollection of the Devanahusha of the Hindus. The Dionysus of the Greeks, the king of Atlantis, whose great empire reached to the farther parts of India, and embraced, according to Plato, parts of the continent of America. Linguistic science achieved a great discovery when it established the fact that there was a continuous belt of languages from Iceland to Ceylon which were the variant forms of one mother tongue, the Indo-European. But it must prepare itself for a still wider generalization. There is abundant proof proof with which pages might be filled that there was a still older mother tongue, from which Aryan, Semitic, and Hamitic were all derived the language of Noah, the language of Atlantis. The language of the great, aggressive empire, of Plato, the language of the empire of the Titans. The Arabic word bin, within, becomes, when it means interval, space, 
bin non, this is the German and Dutch binnen and Saxon bin non, signifying within. The Ethiopian word erf, to fall asleep, is the root of the word Morpheus, the god of sleep. The Hebrew word chana, to dwell, is the parent of the Anglo-Saxon in and Icelandic inni, a house, and of our word in, a hotel. The Hebrew word navel or nafel signifies to fall, from it is derived our word fall and fool, one who falls. The Chaldi word is nabal, to make foul, and the Arabic word nabala means to die, that is, to fall. From the last syllable of the Chaldi nasar, to saw, we can derive the Latin sera, the high German sagan, the Danish sauga, and our word to saw. The Arabic nafida, to fade, is the same as the Italian fadu, the Latin fatuous, foolish, tasteless, the Dutch vaden, and our to fade. The Ethiopic word gaber, to make, to do, and the Arabic word jabara, to make strong, becomes the Welsh word goburu, to work, to operate, the Latin opera, and the English operate. The Arabic word abra signifies to prick, to sting. We see this root in the Welsh bar, a summit, and par, a spear, and pur, a spit, whence our word spear. In the Chaldi, Syriac, and Arabic zug means to join, to couple, from this the Greeks obtain zugos, the Romans jugum, and we the word yoke. While the Germans obtain jock or jog, the Dutch juk, the Swedes okay. The Sanskrit is juga. The Arabic sauna, to be old, reappears in the Latin senex, the Welsh hen, and our senile. The Hebrew bana, to build, is the Irish bun, foundation, and the Latin fundo, fundar, to found. The Arabic baraka, to bend the knee, to fall on the breast, is probably the Saxon braca, the Danish brack, the Swedish braca, Welsh bregu, and our word to break. The Arabic baraka also signifies to rain violently. And from this we get the Saxon roan, to rain, Dutch regan, to rain, Simbric rokia, rain, Welsh reg, rain. The Chaldi word break, a branch, is the Irish break or rake, an arm, the Welsh break, the Latin brachium, and the English brace, something which supports like an arm. The Chaldi frac, to rub, to tread out grain, is the same as the Latin frico, frio, and our word rake. The Arabic word to rub is fraca. The Chaldi rag, ragag, means to desire, to long for. It is the same as the Greek origl, the Latin porigir, the Saxon roeken, the Icelandic rachna, the German riken, and our to reach, to rage. The Arabic rauka, to strain or purify, as wine, is precisely our English word rack, to rack wine. The Hebrew word bara, to create, is our word to bear, as to bear children. A great number of words in all the European languages contain this root in its various modifications. The Hebrew word kafir, to cover, is our word to cover, and coffer, something which covers, and covert, a secret place, from this root also comes the Latin copirio and the French couvrir, to cover. The Arabic word shakala, to bind under the belly, is our word to shackle. From the Arabic walada and Ethiopian wallet, to beget, to bring forth, we get the Welsh laud, a shooting out, and hence our word lad. Our word matter, or pus, is from the Arabic mata, our word mature is originally from the Chaldimita. The Arabic word amida signifies to end, and from this comes the noun, a limit, a termination, Latin meta, and our words meet and meet. I might continue this list, but I have given enough to show that all the Atlantean races once spoke the same language. And that the dispersion on the plains of Shinar signifies that breaking up of the tongues of one people under the operation of vast spaces of time. Philology is yet in its infancy, and the time is not far distant when the identity of the languages of all the Noahic races will be as clearly established and as universally acknowledged as is now the identity of the languages of the Aryan family of nations. And precisely as recent research has demonstrated the relationship between Pekin and Babylon, so investigation in Central America has proved that there is a mysterious bond of union connecting the Chinese and one of the races of Mexico. The resemblances are so great that Mr. Short, North Americans of Antiquity, page 494, says, there is no doubt that strong analogies exist between the Otomi and the Chinese. Senor Nahara, 
Dissertation sobre la lingua Othomi, Mexico, pp. 87, 88, gives a list of words from which I quote the following. Chinese, slash Othomi, slash English. Cho slash to slash the, that. Pa slash to slash to give. Y slash ny slash a wound. Sun slash nsu slash honor. Ten slash gu, mu slash head. Who slash mu slash sir, lord. Co slash sway slash knight. Na slash na slash that. Tn slash tsi slash tooth. Who slash he slash cold. Ye slash yo slash shining. Ye slash he slash end. Kai slash hi, g, slash happiness. Hoa slash hia slash word. Ku slash do slash death. Nugo slash na slash i. Pa slash yo slash no. Ni slash nui slash thou. Na slash ta slash man. How slash no slash the good. Neen slash nsu slash female. Ta slash de slash the great. So slash tsi, ti slash sun. Li slash t slash gain. So slash tsa slash to perfect. Ho slash to slash who. Quan slash quani slash true. Pa slash pa slash to leave. Co slash saw slash to mock. Mu, mo slash me slash mother. Recently her forge hammer, of Leipzig, has published a truly scientific comparison of the grammatical structure of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee, and Seminole languages with the Uralaltaic tongues. In which B has developed many interesting points of resemblance. It has been the custom to ascribe the recognized similarities between the Indians of America and the Chinese and Japanese to a migration by way of Bering Strait from Asia into America. But when we find that the Chinese themselves only reached the Pacific coast within the historical period, and that they came to it from the direction of the Mediterranean and Atlantis. And when we find so many and such distinct recollections of the destruction of Atlantis in the floodlow, wrens of the American races. It seems more reasonable to conclude that the resemblances between the Othomi and the Chinese are to be accounted for by intercourse through Atlantis. We find a confirmation in all these facts of the order in which Genesis names the sons of Noah. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. Can we not suppose that those three sons represent three great races in the order of their precedence? The record of Genesis claims that the Phoenicians were descended from Ham, while the Hebrews were descended from Shem. Yet we find the Hebrews and Phoenicians united by the ties of a common language, common traditions, and common race characteristics. The Jews are the great merchants of the world 18 centuries after Christ, just as the Phoenicians were the great merchants of the world 15 centuries before Christ. Moreover, the Arabians, who are popularly classed as Semites, or sons of Shem, admit in their traditions that they are descended from Ad, the son of Ham. And the tenth chapter of Genesis classes them among the descendants of Ham, calling them Seba, Havila, Rama, etc. If the two great so-called Semitic stocks the Phoenicians and Arabians are Hamites, surely the third member of the group belongs to the same sunburnt race. If we concede that the Jews were also a branch of the Hamitic stock, then we have, firstly, a Semitic stock, the Turanian, embracing the Etruscans, the Finns, the Tartars, the Mongols, the Chinese, and Japanese. Secondly, a Hamitic family, the sunburnt, race a red race including the Kushites, Phoenicians, Egyptians, Hebrews, Berbers, etc. And, thirdly, a Japhetic or whiter stock, embracing the Greeks, Italians, Celts, Goths, and the men who wrote Sanskrit in other words, the entire Aryan family. If we add to these three races the Negro race which cannot be traced back to Atlantis, and is not included, according to Genesis, among the descendants of Noah we have the four races, the white, red, yellow, and black. Recognized by the Egyptians as embracing all the people known to them. There seems to be some confusion in Genesis as to the Semitic stock. It classes different races as both Semites and Hamites, as, for instance, Sheba and Havilah. While the race of Mash, or Meshech, 
is classed among the sons of Shem and the sons of Japheth. In fact, there seems to be a confusion of Hamitic and Semitic stocks. This is shown in the blending of Hamitic and Semitic in some of the most ancient inscriptions, in the facility of intercourse between the Semites of Asia and the Hamites of Egypt. In the peaceful and unobserved absorption of all the Asiatic Hamites, and the Semitic adoption of the Hamitic gods and religious system. It is manifest that, at a period not long previous, the two families had dwelt together and spoken the same language. Winchell's Pre-Adamites, page 36. Is it not more reasonable to suppose that the so-called Semitic races of Genesis were a mere division of the Hamitic stock, and that we are to look for the third great division of the sons of Noah among the Turanians? Francis Lenormand, high authority, is of the opinion that the Turanian races are descended from Magog, the son of Japheth. He regards the Turanians as intermediate between the white and yellow races, graduating insensibly into each. The Uzbeks, the Osmanli Turks, and the Hungarians are not to be distinguished in appearance from the most perfect branches of the white race, on the other hand, the Tkhans almost exactly resemble the Tungauses, who belong to the yellow race. The Turanian languages are marked by the same agglutinative character found in the American races. The Mongolian and the Indian are alike in the absence of a heavy beard. The royal color of the Incas was yellow. Yellow is the color of the imperial family in China. The religion of the Peruvians was sun worship, the sun was the peculiar god of the Mongols from the earliest times. The Peruvians regarded Pakakamak as the sovereign creator. Kamakhaya was the name of a Hindu goddess. Haley was the burden of every verse of the song composed in praise of the sun and the Incas. Mr. John Ranking derives the word Allah from the word Haley, also the word Haliluja. In the city of Cusco was a portion of land which none were permitted to cultivate except those of the royal blood. At certain seasons the Incas turned up the sod here, amid much rejoicing, and many ceremonies. A similar custom prevails in China, the emperor plows a few furrows, and twelve illustrious persons attend the plow after him. Du Hald, Empire of China, Volume 1, page 275. The cycle of sixty years was in use among most of the nations of Eastern Asia, and among the Muiscas of the elevated plains of Bogota. The Kipu, a knotted reckoning cord, was in use in Peru and in China. Bancroft's Native Races, Volume 5, p. 48, in Peru and China, both use hieroglyphics, which are read from above downward. Ibid. It appears most evident to me, says Humboldt, that the monuments, methods of computing time, systems of cosmogony, and many myths of America offer striking analogies with the ideas of Eastern Asia analogies which indicate an ancient communication, and are not simply the result of that uniform condition in which all nations are found in the dawn of civilization. Exam. Crit, Tom. 2, page 68. In the ruined cities of Cambodia, which lies farther to the east of Burma, recent research has discovered Tiakalis like those in Mexico, and the remains of temples of the same type and pattern as those of Yucatan. And when we reach the sea we encounter at Suku, in Java, a Tiakali which is absolutely identical with that of Tehuantepec. Mr. Ferguson said, as we advance eastward from the valley of the Euphrates, at every step we meet with forms of art becoming more and more like those of Central America. Builders of Babel, page 88. Prescott says. The coincidences are sufficiently strong to authorize a belief that the civilization of Anahuac was in some degree influenced by that of Eastern Asia. And, secondly, that the discrepancies are such as to carry back the communication to a very remote period. Mexico, Volume 3, Page 418. All Appearances, Continues Lenormand, Ancient History of the East, Volume 1, p. 64, would lead us to regard the Turanian race as the first branch of the family of Japheth which went forth into the world. And by that premature separation, by an isolated and antagonistic existence, took, or rather preserved, a completely distinct physiognomy. It is a type of the white race imperfectly developed. We may regard this yellow race as the first and oldest wave from Atlantis, and, therefore, 
reaching farthest away from the common source, then came the Hamitic race, then the Japhetic. 9. The Antiquity of Some of Our Great Inventions IT may seem like a flight of the imagination to suppose that the mariner's compass was known to the inhabitants of Atlantis. And yet, if my readers are satisfied that the Atlantean, were a highly civilized maritime people, carrying on commerce with regions as far apart as Peru and Syria. We must conclude that they possessed some means of tracing their course in the great seas they traversed. And accordingly, when we proceed to investigate this subject, we find that as far back as we may go in the study of the ancient races of the world, we find them possessed of a knowledge of the virtues of the magnetic stone. And in the habit of utilizing it. The people of Europe, rising a few centuries since out of a state of semi-barbarism, have been in the habit of claiming the invention of many things which they simply borrowed from the older nations. This was the case with the mariner's compass. It was believed for many years that it was first invented by an Italian named Amalfi, A.D. 1302. In that interesting work, Goodrich's Life of Columbus, we find a curious history of the magnetic compass prior to that time, from which we collate the following points. In A.D. 868 it was employed by the Northmen. The Land Namabach, Volume 1. Chapter 2. An Italian poem of A.D. 1190 refers to it as in use among the Italian sailors at that date. In the ancient language of the Hindus, the Sanskrit which has been a dead language for 2200 years the magnet was called, the precious stone beloved of iron. The Talmud speaks of it as, the stone of attraction. And it is alluded to in the early Hebrew prayers as Kalamita, the same name given it by the Greeks, from the reed upon which the compass floated. The Phoenicians were familiar with the use of the magnet. At the prow of their vessels stood the figure of a woman, a start, holding a cross in one hand and pointing the way with the other. The cross represented the compass, which was a magnetized needle, floating in water crosswise upon a piece of reed or wood. The cross became the coat of arms of the Phoenicians not only, possibly, as we have shown, as a recollection of the four rivers of Atlantis, but because it represented the secret of their great sea voyages. To which they owed their national greatness. The Hyperborean magician, Abras, carried, a guiding arrow, which Pythagoras gave him, in order that it may be useful to him in all difficulties in his long journey. Herodotus, Volume 4, Page 36 the magnet was called the Stone of Hercules. Hercules was the patron divinity of the Phoenicians. He was, as we have shown elsewhere, one of the gods of Atlantis probably one of its great kings and navigators. The Atlanteans were, as Plato tells us, a maritime, commercial people, trading up the Mediterranean as far as Egypt and Syria, and across the Atlantic to, the whole opposite continent that surrounds the sea. The Phoenicians, as their successors and descendants, and colonized on the shores of the Mediterranean, inherited their civilization and their maritime habits, and with these that invention without which their great voyages were impossible. From them the magnet passed to the Hindus, and from them to the Chinese, who certainly possessed it at an early date. In the year 2700 BC, the Emperor Wang Ti placed a magnetic figure with an extended arm, like the Astarte of the Phoenicians, on the front of carriages, the arm always turning and pointing to the south, which the Chinese regarded as the principal pole. See Goodrich's, Columbus, page 31, etc. This illustration represents one of these chariots. In the 7th century it was used by the navigators of the Baltic Sea and the German Ocean. The ancient Egyptians called the lodestone the bone of Hariri, and iron the bone of Typhon. Hariri was the son of Osiris and grandson of Rhea, a goddess of the earth, a queen of Atlantis, and mother of Poseidon. Typhon was a wind god and an evil genius, but also a son of Rhea, the earth goddess. Do we find in this curious designation of iron and lodestone as, bones of the descendants of the earth, an explanation of that otherwise inexplicable Greek legend about Deucalion, throwing the bones of the earth behind him? When instantly men rose from the ground, and the world was repeopled. Does it mean that by means of the magnet he sailed, after the flood, to the European colonies of Atlantis? Already thickly inhabited? A late writer, speaking upon the subject of the lodestone, tells us. 
Hercules, it was said, being once overpowered by the heat of the sun, drew his bow against that luminary. Whereupon the god Phoebus, admiring his intrepidity, gave him a golden cup, with which he sailed over the ocean. This cup was the compass, which old writers have called Lapis Heracleus. Pisander says Oceanus lent him the cup, and Lucian says it was a seashell. Tradition affirms that the magnet originally was not on a pivot, but set to float on water in a cup. The old antiquarian is wildly theoretical on this point, and sees a compass in the golden fleece of Argos, in the oracular needle which Nero worshipped, and in everything else. Yet undoubtedly there are some curious facts connected with the matter. Osonius says that Gama and the Portuguese got the compass from some pirates at the Cape of Good Hope, A.D. 1260. M. Fawcett, the French antiquarian, finds it plainly alluded to in some old poem of Brittany belonging to the year A.D. 1180. Paolo Venetus brought it in the 13th century from China, where it was regarded as oracular. Jean Brand says Melvius, a Neapolitan, brought it to Europe in A.D. 1303. Costa says Gama got it from Mohammed and Seaman. But all nations with whom it was found associated with regions where Heraclean myths prevailed. And one of the most curious facts is that the ancient Britons, as the Welsh do today, call a pilot LLYWYDD, load. Load manage, in Skinner's etymology, is the word for the price paid to a pilot. But whether this famous, and afterward deified, mariner, Hercules, had a compass or not, we can hardly regard the association of his name with so many Western monuments as accidental. Hercules was, as we know, a god of Atlantis, and Oceanos, who lent the magnetic cup to Hercules, was the dame by which the Greeks designated the Atlantic Ocean. And this may be the explanation of the recurrence of a cup in many antique paintings and statues. Hercules is often represented with a cup in his hand. We even find the cup upon the handle of the bronze dagger found in Denmark, and represented in the chapter on the Bronze Age, in this work. See page 254 ante. So oracular, an object as this self-moving needle, always pointing to the north, would doubtless affect vividly the minds of the people, and appear in their works of art. When Hercules left the coast of Europe to sail to the island of Erythea in the Atlantic, in the remote west, we are told, in Greek mythology, Murray, p. 257, that he borrowed the cup of Helios, in, with, which he was accustomed to sail every night. Here we seem to have a reference to the magnetic cup used in night sailing. And this is another proof that the use of the magnetic needle in sea voyages was associated with the Atlantean gods. Lucian tells us that a seashell often took the place of the cup, as a vessel in which to hold the water where the needle floated, and hence upon the ancient coins of Tyre we find a seashell represented. Here, too, we have the pillars of Hercules, supposed to have been placed at the mouth of the Mediterranean, and the tree of life or knowledge, with the serpent twined around it, which appears in Genesis. And in the combination of the two pillars and the serpent we have, it is said, the original source of our dollar mark, dollar. Compare these Phoenician coins with the following representation of a copper coin, two inches in diameter and three lines thick, found nearly a century ago by Ordonez, at the city of Guatemala. M. Dupaix noticed an indication of the use of the compass in the center of one of the sides, the figures on the same side representing a kneeling, bearded, turbaned man between two fierce heads, perhaps of crocodiles which appear to defend the entrance to a mountainous and wooded country. The reverse presents a serpent coiled around a fruit tree, and an eagle on a hill. Bancroft's Native Races, Volume 4, page 118. The mountain leans to one side, it is a, Colhuacan, or Crooked Mountain. We find in Sanctaniathan's Legends of the Phoenicians that Uranus, the first god of the people of Atlantis, devised Betulia, contriving stones that moved as having life, which were supposed to fall from heaven. These stones were probably magnetic lodestones, in other words, Uranus, the first god of Atlantis, devised the mariner's compass. I find in the Report of United States Explorations for a Route for a Pacific Railroad, a description of a New Mexican Indian priest, who foretells the result of a proposed war by placing a piece of wood in a bowl of water. 
and causing it to turn to the right or left, or sink or rise, as he directs it. This is incomprehensible, unless the wood, like the ancient Chinese compass, contained a piece of magnetic iron hidden in it, which would be attracted or repulsed, or even drawn downward, by a piece of iron held in the hand of the priest. On the outside of the bowl. If so, this trick was a remembrance of the mariner's compass transmitted from age to age by the medicine men. The reclining statue of Chikmol, of Central America, holds a bowl or dish upon its breast. Divination was the Ars Etrusca. The Etruscans set their temple squarely with the cardinal points of the compass, so did the Egyptians, the Mexicans, and the mound builders of America. Could they have done this without the magnetic compass? The Romans and the Persians called the line of the axis of the globe Cardo, and it was to Cardo the needle pointed. Now, Cardo was the name of the mountain on which the human race took refuge from the deluge. The primitive geographic point for the countries which were the cradle of the human race. Urquhart's Pillars of Hercules, Volume 1, page 145. From this comes our word, cardinal, as the cardinal points. Navigation. Navigation was not by any means in a rude state in the earliest times. In the wanderings of the heroes returning from Troy, Aristorchus makes Menelaus circumnavigate Africa more than 500 years before Nico sailed from Gadira to India. Cosmos, Volume 2, Page 144. In the tomb of Ramesses the Great is a representation of a naval combat between the Egyptians and some other people, supposed to be the Phoenicians, whose huge ships are propelled by sails. Goodrich's, Columbus, p. 29. The proportions of the fastest sailing vessels of the present day are about 300 feet long to 50 wide and 30 high, these were precisely the proportions of Noah's Ark, 300 cubits long, 50 broad, and 30 high. Hiero of Syracuse built, under the superintendence of Archimedes, a vessel which consumed in its construction the material for 50 galleys. It contained galleries, gardens, stables, fish ponds, mills, baths, a temple of Venus, and an engine to throw stones 300 pounds in weight, and arrows 36 feet long. The floors of this monstrous vessel were inlaid with scenes from Homer's Iliad. Ibid, page 30. The fleet of Sesostris consisted of 400 ships, and when Semiramis invaded India she was opposed by 4,000 vessels. It is probable that in the earliest times the vessels were sheeted with metal. A Roman ship of the time of Trajan has been recovered from Lake Riciole after 1300 years. The outside was covered with sheets of lead fastened with small copper nails. Even the use of iron chains in place of ropes for the anchors was known at an early period. Julius Caesar tells us that the galleys of the Venity were thus equipped. Goodrich's, Columbus, page 31. Gunpowder. It is not impossible that even the invention of gunpowder may date back to Atlantis. It was certainly known in Europe long before the time of the German monk, Berthold Schwartz, who is commonly credited with the invention of it. It was employed in 1257 at the siege of Nibla, in Spain. It was described in an Arab treatise of the 13th century. In AD 811 the Emperor Leo employed firearms. Greek fire is supposed to have been gunpowder mixed with resin or petroleum and thrown in the form of fuses and explosive shells. It was introduced from Egypt AD 668. In AD 690 the Arabs used firearms against Mecca, bringing the knowledge of them from India. In AD 80 the Chinese obtained from India a knowledge of gunpowder. There is reason to believe that the Carthaginian, Phoenician, general Hannibal, used gunpowder in breaking a way for his army over the Alps. The Romans, who were ignorant of its use, said that Hannibal made his way by making fires against the rocks and pouring vinegar and water over the ashes. It is evident that fire and vinegar would have no effect on masses of the Alps great enough to arrest the march of an army. Dr. William Magin has suggested that the wood was probably burnt by Hannibal to obtain charcoal. And the word which has been translated, vinegar, probably signified some preparation of nitre and sulfur, and that Hannibal made gunpowder and blew up the rocks. 
The same author suggests that the story of Hannibal breaking loose from the mountains where he was surrounded on all sides by the Romans, and in danger of starvation, by fastening firebrands to the horns of two thousand oxen, and sending them rushing at night among the terrified Romans, simply refers to the use of rockets. As Maginwell asks, how could Hannibal be in danger of starvation when he had two thousand oxen to spare for such an experiment? And why should the veteran Roman troops have been so terrified and panic-stricken by a lot of cattle with firebrands on their horns? At the Battle of Lake Tracymene, between Hannibal and Flaminius, we have another curious piece of information which goes far to confirm the belief that Hannibal was familiar with the use of gunpowder. In the midst of the battle there was, say the Roman historians, an earthquake. The earth reeled under the feet of the soldiers, a tremendous crash was heard, a fog or smoke covered the scene, the earth broke open, and the rocks fell upon the heads of the Romans. This reads very much as if the Carthaginians had decoyed the Romans into a pass where they had already planted a mine, and had exploded it at the proper moment to throw them into a panic. Earthquakes do not cast rocks up in the air to fall on men's heads. And that this is not all surmise is shown by the fact that a city of India, in the time of Alexander the Great, defended itself by the use of gunpowder, it was said to be a favorite of the gods. Because thunder and lightning came from its walls to resist the attacks of its assailants. As the Hebrews were a branch of the Phoenician race, it is not surprising that we find some things in their history which look very much like legends of gunpowder. When Korah, Dathan, and Abram led a rebellion against Moses, Moses separated the faithful from the unfaithful, and thereupon, the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses. And all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. And there came out a fire from the Lord, and consumed the two hundred and fifty men that offered incense. But on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. Num, 16, 31-41 This looks very much as if Moses had blown up the rebels with gunpowder. Roger Bacon, who himself rediscovered gunpowder, was of opinion that the event described in Judges 7. Where Gideon captured the camp of the Midianites with the roar of trumpets, the crash caused by the breaking of innumerable pitchers, and the flash of a multitude of lanterns, had reference to the use of gunpowder. That the noise made by the breaking of the pitchers represented the detonation of an explosion, the flame of the lights the blaze, and the noise of the trumpets the thunder of the gunpowder. We can understand, in this wise, the results that followed. But we cannot otherwise understand how the breaking of pitchers, the flashing of lamps, and the clangor of trumpets would throw an army into panic, until every man's sword was set against his fellow, and the host fled to Bethshitta. And this, too, without any attack upon the part of the Israelites, for, they stood every man in his place around the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. If it was a miraculous interposition in behalf of the Jews, the Lord could have scared the Midianites out of their wits without the smashed pitchers and lanterns. And certain it is the pitchers, and lanterns would not have done the work without a miraculous interposition. Having traced the knowledge of gunpowder back to the most remote times, and to the different races which were descended from Atlantis. We are not surprised to find in the legends of Greek mythology events described which are only explicable by supposing that the Atlanteans possessed the secret of this powerful explosive. A rebellion sprang up in Atlantis, C. Murray's, Manual of Mythology, p. 0 .30, against Zeus. It is known in mythology as the, War of the Titans. The struggle lasted many years, all the might which the Olympians could bring to bear being useless, until, on the advice of Gia, Zeus set free the Kyclopes and the Hecatonchires, that is, brought the ships into play, of whom the former fashioned thunderbolts for him, while the latter advanced on his side with force equal to the shock of an earthquake. The earth trembled down to lowest Tartarus as Zeus now appeared with his terrible weapon and new allies. Old Chaos thought his hour had come, as from a continuous blaze of thunderbolts the earth took fire, and the waters seethed in the sea. The rebels were partly slain or consumed, and partly hurled into deep chasms, with rocks and hills reeling after them. 
Do not these words picture the explosion of a mine with a force equal to the shock of an earthquake? We have already shown that the Kyklopes and Hecatonkirs were probably great warships, armed with some explosive material in the nature of gunpowder. Zeus, the king of Atlantis, was known as the Thunderer, and was represented armed with thunderbolts. Some ancient nation must, in the most remote ages, have invented gunpowder. And is it unreasonable to attribute it to that great original race rather than to any one people of their posterity, who seem to have borrowed all the other arts from them? And who, during many thousands of years, did not add a single new invention to the list they received from Atlantis? Iron have seen that the Greek mythological legends asserted that before the submergence of the great race over whom their gods reigned there had been not only an age of bronze but an age of iron. This metal was known to the Egyptians in the earliest ages, fragments of iron have been found in the oldest pyramids. The Iron Age in Northern Europe far antedated intercourse with the Greeks or Romans. In the mounds of the Mississippi Valley, as I have shown, the remains of iron implements have been found. In the Mercurio Peruano, Tom. I. P. 201, 1791, it is stated that anciently the Peruvian sovereigns worked magnificent iron mines at Encoriames, on the west shore of Lake Titicaca. It is remarkable, says Molina, that iron, which has been thought unknown to the ancient Americans, had particular names in some of their tongues. In official Peruvian it was called Quile, and in Chilean Panilic. The mound builders fashioned implements out of meteoric iron. Foster's, Prehistoric Races, page 333. As we find this metal known to man in the earliest ages on both sides of the Atlantic, the presumption is very strong that it was borrowed by the nations, east and west, from Atlantis. Paper, the same argument holds good as to paper. The oldest Egyptian monuments contain pictures of the papyrus roll, while in Mexico, as I have shown, a beautiful paper was manufactured and formed into books shaped like our own. In Peru a paper was made of plantain leaves, and books were common in the earlier ages. Humboldt mentions books of hieroglyphical writings among the panos, which were, bundles of their paper resembling our volumes in quarto. Silk Manufacture The manufacture of a woven fabric of great beauty out of the delicate fiber of the egg cocoon of a worm could only have originated among a people who had attained the highest degree of civilization. It implies the art of weaving by delicate instruments, a dense population, a patient, skillful, artistic people, a sense of the beautiful, and a wealthy and luxurious class to purchase such costly fabrics. We trace it back to the most remote ages. In the introduction to the History of Hindustan, or rather of the Mohammedan dynasties, by Muhammad Qasim, it is stated that in the year 3870 BC an Indian king sent various silk stuffs as a present to the king of Persia. The art of making silk was known in China more than 2600 years before the Christian era, at the time when we find them first possessed of civilization. The Phoenicians dealt in silks in the most remote past. They imported them from India and sold them along the shores of the Mediterranean. It is probable that the Egyptians understood and practiced the art of manufacturing silk. It was woven in the island of Kos in the time of Aristotle. The Babylonish garment referred to in Joshua, chapter 7, 21, and for secreting which Achan lost his life, was probably a garment of silk, it was rated above silver and gold in value. It is not a violent presumption to suppose that an art known to the Hindus 3870 BC, and to the Chinese and Phoenicians at the very beginning of their history an art so curious, so extraordinary may have dated back to Atlantean times. Civil Government, Mr. Baldwin shows, Prehistoric Nations, p. 114, that the Kushites, the successors of the Atlanteans, whose very ancient empire extended from Spain to Syria, were the first to establish independent municipal republics, with the right of the people to govern themselves. And that this system was perpetuated in the great Phoenician communities, in the fierce democracies of ancient Greece, in the village republics of the African Berbers and the Hindus, in the free cities of the Middle Ages in Europe. And in the independent governments of the Basques, which continued down to our own day. The Kushite state was an aggregation of municipalities, each possessing the right of self-government, 
but subject within prescribed limits to a general authority. In other words, it was precisely the form of government possessed today by the United States. It is a surprising thought that the perfection of modern government may be another perpetuation of Atlantean civilization. Agriculture The Greek traditions of the golden apples of the Hesperides and the golden fleece point to Atlantis. The allusions to the golden apples indicate that tradition regarded the islands of the blessed in the Atlantic Ocean as a place of orchards. And when we turn to Egypt we find that in the remotest times many of our modern garden and field plants were there cultivated. When the Israelites murmured in the wilderness against Moses, they cried out, Num, chapter 11. 4, 5, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. The Egyptians also cultivated wheat, barley, oats, flax, hemp, etc. In fact, if we were to take away from civilized man the domestic animals, the cereals, and the field and garden vegetables possessed by the Egyptians at the very dawn of history, there would be very little left for the granaries or the tables of the world. Astronomy The knowledge of the ancients as to astronomy was great and accurate. Callisthenes, who accompanied Alexander the Great to Babylon, sent to Aristotle a series of Chaldean astronomical observations which he found preserved there, recorded on tablets of baked clay, and extending back as far as 2234 BC. Humboldt says, the Chaldeans knew the mean motions of the moon with an exactness which induced the Greek astronomers to use their calculations for the foundation of a lunar theory. The Chaldeans knew the true nature of comets, and could foretell their reappearance. A lens of considerable power was found in the ruins of Babylon, it was an inch and a half in diameter and nine-tenths of an inch thick. Layards, Nineveh and Babylon, pages 16, 17. Nero used optical glasses when bewatched the fights of the gladiators, they are supposed to have come from Egypt and the East. Plutarch speaks of optical instruments used by Archimedes to manifest to the eye the largeness of the sun. There are actual astronomical calculations in existence, with calendars formed upon them, which eminent astronomers of England and France admit to be genuine and true, and which carry back the antiquity of the science of astronomy. Together with the constellations, to within a few years of the deluge, even on the longer chronology of the Septuagint. The Miracle in Stone, page 142. Josephus attributes the invention of the constellations to the family of the antediluvian Seth, the son of Adam. While Origen affirms that it was asserted in the Book of Enoch that in the time of that patriarch the constellations were already divided and named. The Greeks associated the origin of astronomy with Atlas and Hercules, Atlantean kings or heroes. The Egyptians regarded Tot, At, or Thoth, or At Oats, as the originator of both astronomy and the alphabet. Doubtless he represented a civilized people, by whom their country was originally colonized. Bailey and others assert that astronomy must have been established when the summer solstice was in the first degree of Virgo, and that the solar and lunar zodiacs were of similar antiquity, which would be about 4,000 years before. The Christian Era They suppose the originators to have lived in about the 40th degree of north latitude, and to have been a highly civilized people. It will be remembered that the 40th degree of north latitude passed through Atlantis. Plato knew, Dialogues, Phaedo, 108, that the earth is a body in the center of the heavens, held in equipoise. He speaks of it as a round body, a globe. He even understood that it revolved on its axis, and that these revolutions produced day and night. He says, Dialogues, Timaeus, the earth circling around the pole, which is extended through the universe, be made to be the artificer of night and day. All this Greek learning was probably drawn from the Egyptians. Only among the Atlanteans in Europe and America do we find traditions preserved as to the origin of all the principal inventions which have raised man from a savage to a civilized condition. We can give in part the very names of the inventors. Starting with the Chippeway legends, and following with the Bible and Phoenician records, we make a table like the appended. The invention or discovery slash the race slash the inventors. Fire slash Atlantean slash Foss, 
fur, and flocks. The bow and arrow slash chip away slash manaboshu. The use of flint slash forward slash. The use of copper slash forward slash. The manufacture of bricks slash Atlantean slash autochthon and technites. Agriculture and hunting slash slash argos and agrotes. Village life and the rearing of flocks slash slash aminos and muggos. The use of salt slash slash miser and sydyk. The use of letters slash slash totos or tot. Navigation slash slash the cavalry or carbans. The art of music slash Hebrew slash jubal. Metallurgy and the use of iron slash slash jubal cane. The syrinx slash Greek slash pan. The lyre slash slash Hermes. We cannot consider all these evidences of the vast antiquity of the great inventions upon which our civilization mainly rests, including the art of writing, which, as I have shown, dates back far beyond the beginning of history. We cannot remember that the origin of all the great food plants, such as wheat, oats, barley, rye, and maize, is lost in the remote past. And that all the domesticated animals, the horse, the ass, the ox, the sheep, the goat, and the hog had been reduced to subjection to man in ages long previous to written history. Without having the conclusion forced upon us irresistibly that beyond Egypt and Greece, beyond Chaldea and China, there existed a mighty civilization, of which these states were but the broken fragments. X. The Aryan Colonies from Atlantis We come now to another question, did the Aryan or Japhetic race come from Atlantis? If the Aryans are the Japhetic race, and if Japheth was one of the sons of the patriarch who escaped from the deluge, then assuredly, if the tradition of Genesis be true, the Aryans came from the drowned land, to wit, Atlantis. According to Genesis, the descendants of the Japheth who escaped out of the flood with Noah are the Ionians, the inhabitants of the Moria, the dwellers on the Cilician coast of Asia Minor, the Cyprians, the Dodonians of Macedonia, the Iberians, and the Thracians. These are all now recognized as Aryans, except the Iberians. From non-biblical sources, says Winchell, we obtain further information respecting the early dispersion of the Japhethites or Indo-Europeans called also Aryans. All determinations confirm the biblical account of their primitive residence in the same country with the Hamites and Semites. Rawlinson informs us that even Aryan roots are mingled with pre-Semitic in some of the old inscriptions of Assyria. The precise region where these three families dwelt in a common home has not been pointed out. Preadamites, page 43. I have shown in the chapter in relation to Peru that all the languages of the Hamites, Semites, and Japhethites are varieties of one aboriginal speech. The center of the Aryan migrations, according to popular opinion, within the historical period was Armenia. Here too is Mount Ararat, where it is said the Ark rested another identification with the flood regions, as it represents the usual transfer of the Atlantis legend by an Atlantean people to a high mountain in their new home. Now turn to a map, suppose the ships of Atlantis to have reached the shores of Syria, at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, where dwelt a people who, as we have seen, used the Central American Maya alphabet. The Atlantis ships are then but 200 miles distant from Armenia. But these ships need not stop at Syria, they can go by the Dardanelles and the Black Sea, by uninterrupted water communication, to the shores of Armenia itself. If we admit, then, that it was from Armenia the Aryans stocked Europe and India, there is no reason why the original population of Armenia should not have been themselves colonists from Atlantis. But we have seen that in the earliest ages, before the first Armenian migration of the historical Aryans, a people went from Iberian Spain and settled in Ireland, and the language of this people, it is now admitted, is Aryan. And these Iberians were originally, according to tradition, from the West. The Mediterranean Aryans are known to have been in southeastern Europe, along the shores of the Mediterranean, 2000 BC. They at that early date possessed the plough. Also wheat, rye, barley, gold, silver, and bronze. Aryan faces are found depicted upon the monuments of Egypt, painted 4,000 years before the time of Christ. The conflicts between the Celts, an Aryan race, 
and the Iberians were far anterior in date to the settlements of the Phoenicians, Greeks, Carthaginians, and Nochites on the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea. American Cyclopedia, Art. Basques. There is reason to believe that these Celts were originally part of the population and empire of Atlantis. We are told, Reza's British Encyclopedia, Art. Titans, that, Mercury, one of the Atlantean gods, was placed as ruler over the Celti, and became their great divinity. F. Hezron, in his, Antiquity of the Celti, makes out that the Celti were the same as the Titans, the giant race who rebelled in Atlantis, and that their princes were the same with the giants of Scripture. He adds that the word Titan is perfect Celtic and comes from Tit, the earth, and Ten or Den, man, and hence the Greeks very properly also called them Terigeni, or earthborn. And it will be remembered that Plato uses the same phrase when he speaks of the race into which Poseidon intermarried as, the earthborn primeval men of that country. The Greeks, who are Aryans, traced their descent from the people who were destroyed by the flood, as did other races clearly Aryan. The nations who are comprehended under the common appellation of Indo-European, says Max Muller, the Hindus, the Persians, the Celts, Germans, Romans, Greeks, and Slavs do not only share the same words and the same grammar. Slightly modified in each country, but they seem to have likewise preserved a mass of popular traditions which had grown up before they left their common home. Bonfay, L. Geiger, and other students of the ancient Indo-European languages, have recently advanced the opinion that the original home of the Indo-European races must be sought in Europe. Because their stock of words is rich in the names of plants and animals, and contains names of seasons that are not found in tropical countries or anywhere in Asia. American Cyclopedia, Art. Ethnology. By the study of comparative philology, or the seeking out of the words common to the various branches of the Aryan race before they separated, we are able to reconstruct an outline of the civilization of that ancient people. Max Muller has given this subject great study, and availing ourselves of his researches we can determine the following facts as to the progenitors of the Aryan stock, they were a civilized race, they possessed the institution of marriage. They recognized the relationship of father, mother, son, daughter, grandson, brother, sister, mother-in-law, father-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, brother-in-law, and sister-in-law, and had separate words for each of these relationships which we are only able to express by adding the words, in-law. They recognized also the condition of widows, or, the husbandless. They lived in an organized society, governed by a king. They possessed houses with doors and solid walls. They had wagons and carriages. They possessed family names. They dwelt in towns and cities, on highways. They were not hunters or nomads. They were a peaceful people, the warlike words in the different Aryan languages cannot be traced back to this original race. They lived in a country having few wild beasts, the only wild animals whose names can be assigned to this parent stock being the bear, the wolf, and the serpent. The name of the elephant, the beast with a hand, occurs only twice in the Rig Veda. A singular omission if the Aryans were from time immemorial an Asiatic race, and, when it does occur, it is in such a way as to show that he was still an object of wonder and terror to them. Whitney's Oriental and Linguistic Studies, page 26. They possessed nearly all the domestic animals we now have the ox and the cow, the horse, the dog, the sheep, the goat, the hog, the donkey, and the goose. They divided the year into twelve months. They were farmers, they used the plow. Their name as a race, Aryan, was derived from it, they were, par excellence, pluffmen, they raised various kinds of grain, including flax, barley, hemp, and wheat, they had mills and millers, and ground their corn. The presence of millers shows that they had proceeded beyond the primitive condition where each family ground its corn in its own mill. They used fire, and cooked and baked their food, they wove cloth and wore clothing, they spun wool. They possessed the different metals, even iron, they had gold. The word for water also meant salt made from water, from which it might be inferred that the water with which they were familiar was salt water. 
it is evident they manufactured salt by evaporating salt water. They possessed boats and ships. They had progressed so far as to perfect a decimal system of enumeration, in itself, says Max Muller, one of the most marvelous achievements of the human mind, based on an abstract conception of quantity. Regulated by a philosophical classification, and yet conceived, nurtured, and finished before the soil of Europe was trodden by Greek, Roman, Slav, or Teuton. And herein we find another evidence of relationship between the Aryans and the people of Atlantis. Although Plato does not tell us that the Atlanteans possessed the decimal system of numeration, nevertheless there are many things in his narrative which point to that conclusion, there were ten kings ruling over ten provinces. The whole country was divided into military districts or squares ten stadia each way, the total force of chariots was ten thousand, the great ditch or canal was one hundred feet deep and ten thousand stadia long. There were one hundred nereids, etc. In the Peruvian colony the decimal system clearly obtained, the army had heads of ten, fifty, a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, ten thousand. The community at large was registered in groups, under the control of officers over tens, fifties, hundreds, and so on. Herbert Spencer, Development of Political Institutions, Chapter 10 The same division into tens and hundreds obtained among the Anglo-Saxons. Where, we ask, could this ancient nation, which existed before Greek was Greek, Celt was Celt, Hindu was Hindu, or Goth was Goth, have been located? The common opinion says, in Armenia or Bactria, in Asia. But where in Asia could they have found a country so peaceful as to know no terms for war or bloodshed, a country so civilized as to possess no wild beasts save the bear, wolf, and serpent? No people could have been developed in Asia without bearing in its language traces of century-long battles for life with the rude and barbarous races around them. No nation could have fought for ages for existence against man-eating, tigers, lions, elephants, and hyenas, without bearing the memory of these things in their tongue. A tiger, identical with that of Bengal, still exists around Lake Errol, in Asia. From time to time it is seen in Siberia. The last tiger killed in 1828 was on the Lena, in latitude 52 degrees 30 minutes, in a climate colder than that of St. Petersburg and Stockholm. The fathers of the Aryan race must have dwelt for many thousand years so completely protected from barbarians and wild beasts that they at last lost all memory of them, and all words descriptive of them. And where could this have been possible save in some great, long civilized land, surrounded by the sea, and isolated from the attack of the savage tribes that occupied the rest of the world? And if such a great civilized nation had dwelt for centuries in Asia, Europe, or Africa, why have not their monuments long ago been discovered and identified? Where is the race who are their natural successors, and who must have continued to live after them in that sheltered and happy land, where they knew no human and scarcely any animal enemies? Why would any people have altogether left such a home? Why, when their civilization had spread to the ends of the earth, did it cease to exist in the peaceful region where it originated? Savage nations cannot usually count beyond five. This people had names for the numerals up to 100, and the power, doubtless, of combining these to still higher powers, as 300, 500, 1000, etc. Says a high authority, if any more proof were wanted as to the reality of that period which must have preceded the dispersion of the Aryan race. We might appeal to the Aryan numerals as irrefragable evidence of that long-continued intellectual life which characterizes that period. Such a degree of progress implies necessarily an alphabet, writing, commerce, and trade, even as the existence of words for boats and ships has already implied navigation. In what have we added to the civilization of this ancient people? Their domestic animals were the same as our own, except one fowl adopted from America. In the past ten thousand years we have added one bird to their list of domesticated animals. They raised wheat and wool, and spun and wove as we do, except that we have added some mechanical contrivances to produce the same results. Their metals are ours. Even iron, the triumph, as we had supposed, of more modern times, they had already discovered. 
And it must not be forgotten that Greek mythology tells us that the godlike race who dwelt on Olympus, that great island, in the midst of the Atlantic, in the remote west, wrought in iron. And we find the remains of an iron sword and meteoric iron weapons in the mounds of the Mississippi Valley, while the name of the metal is found in the ancient languages of Peru and Chile, and the Incas worked in iron on the shores of Lake Titicaca. A still further evidence of the civilization of this ancient race is found in the fact that, before the dispersion from their original home, the Aryans had reached such a degree of development that they possessed a regularly organized religion, they worshipped God, they believed in an evil spirit, they believed in a heaven for the just. All this presupposes temples, priests, sacrifices, and an orderly state of society. We have seen that Greek mythology is really a history of the kings and queens of Atlantis. When we turn to that other branch of the great Aryan family, the Hindus, we find that their gods are also the kings of Atlantis. The Hindu god Varana is conceded to be the Greek god Uranos, who is the founder of the royal family of Atlantis. In the Veda we find a hymn to King Varana, in which occurs this passage. This earth, too, belongs to Varana, the king, and this wide sky, with its ends far apart. The two seas are Varana's loins, he is contained also in this drop of water. Again in the Veda we find another hymn to King Varana. He who knows the place of the birds that fly through the sky, who on the waters knows the ships. He, the upholder of order, who knows the twelve months with the offspring of each, and knows the month that is engendered afterward. This verse would seem to furnish additional proof that the Vedas were written by a maritime people. And in the allusion to the twelve months we are reminded of the Peruvians, who also divided the year into twelve parts of thirty days each, and afterward added six days to complete the year. The Egyptians and Mexicans also had intercalary days for the same purpose. But, above all, it must be remembered that the Greeks, an Aryan race, in their mythological traditions, show the closest relationship to Atlantis. At Tyca and at Hens are reminiscences of Ad, and we are told that Poseidon, god and founder of Atlantis, founded Athens. We find in the Eleusinian Mysteries an Atlantean institution. Their influence during the whole period of Greek history down to the coming of Christianity was extraordinary. And even then this masonry of pre-Christian days, in which kings and emperors begged to be initiated, was, it is claimed, continued to our own times in our own Freemasons, who trace their descent back to a Dionysiac fraternity which originated in Attica. And just as we have seen the Saturnalian festivities of Italy descending from Atlantean harvest feasts, so these Eleusinian mysteries can be traced back to Plato's island. Poseidon was at the base of them. The first hierophant, Eumalpus, was a son of Poseidon, and all the ceremonies were associated with seed time and harvest, and with Demeter or Ceres, an Atlantean goddess, daughter of Kronos, who first taught the Greeks to use the plow and to plant barley. And, as the carnival is a survival of the Saturnalia, so masonry is a survival of the Eleusinian mysteries. The roots of the institutions of today reach back to the Miocene age. We have seen that Zeus, the king of Atlantis, whose tomb was shown at Crete, was transformed into the Greek god Zeus, and in like manner we find him reappearing among the Hindus as Jyosh. He is called Jyosh Patar, or God the Father, as among the Greeks we have Zeus Pater, which became among the Romans, Jupiter. The strongest connection, however, with the Atlantean system is shown in the case of the Hindu god Devanahusha. We have seen in the chapter on Greek mythology that Dionysus was a son of Zeus and grandson of Poseidon, being thus identified with Atlantis. When he arrived at manhood, said the Greeks, he set out on a journey through all known countries, even into the remotest parts of India, instructing the people, as be preceded, how to tend the vine, and how to practice many other arts of peace. Besides teaching them the value of just and honorable dealings. He was praised everywhere as the greatest benefactor of mankind. Murray's Mythology, page 119. In other words, B represented the great Atlantean civilization, reaching into the remotest parts of India, and to all parts of the known world, from America to Asia. In consequence of the connection of this king with the vine, he was converted in later times into the dissolute god Bacchus. 
but everywhere the traditions concerning him refer us back to Atlantis. All the legends of Egypt, India, Asia Minor, and the older Greeks describe him as a king very great during his life, and deified after death. Amon, king of Arabia or Ethiopia, married Rhea, sister of Kronos, who reigned over Italy, Sicily, and certain countries of northern Africa. Dionysus, according to the Egyptians, was the son of Amon by the beautiful Amalthea. Kronos and Amon had a prolonged war, Dionysus defeated Kronos and captured his capital, dethroned him, and put his son Zeus in his place, Zeus reigned nobly, and won a great fame. Dionysus succeeded his father Amon, and became the greatest of sovereigns. He extended his sway in all the neighboring countries, and completed the conquest of India. He gave much attention to the Kushite colonies in Egypt, greatly increasing their strength, intelligence, and prosperity. Baldwin's, Prehistoric Nations, page 283. When we turn to the Hindu we still find this Atlantean king. In the Sanskrit books we find reference to a god called Devanahusha, who has been identified by scholars with Dionysus. He is connected with the oldest history and mythology in the world. He is said to have been a contemporary with Indra, king of Meru, who was also deified, and who appears in the Veda as a principal form of representation of the Supreme Being. The warmest colors of imagination are used in portraying the greatness of Devanahusha. For a time he had sovereign control of affairs in Meru, he conquered the seven Dwipas, and led his armies through all the known countries of the world. By means of matchless wisdom and miraculous heroism he made his empire universal. Ibid, page 287. Here we see that the great god Indra, chief god of the Hindus, was formerly king of Meru, and that Devanahusha, the, V.A., Nushas Dhanushas, had also been king of Meru. And we must remember that Theopompus tell us that the island of Atlantis was inhabited by the Meropes, and Lenormand has reached the conclusion that the first people of the ancient world were, the men of Mero. We can well believe, when we see traces of the same civilization extending from Peru and Lake Superior to Armenia and the frontiers of China, that this Atlantean kingdom was indeed, universal. And extended through all the, known countries of the world. We can see in the legends that Pururavas, Nahusha, and others had no connection with Sanskrit history. They are referred to ages very long anterior to the Sanskrit immigration, and must have been great personages celebrated in the traditions of the natives or Dasius. Pururavas was a king of great renown, who ruled over thirteen islands of the ocean, altogether surrounded by inhuman, or superhuman, personages, he engaged in a contest with Brahmins, and perished. Nahusha, mentioned by Maul, and in many legends, as famous for hostility to the Brahmins, lived at the time when Indra ruled on earth. He was a very great king, who ruled with justice a mighty empire, and attained the sovereignty of three worlds. Europe, Africa, and America. Being intoxicated with pride, he was arrogant to Brahmins, compelled them to bear his palanquin, and even dared to touch one of them with his foot, kicked him, whereupon B was transformed into a serpent. Baldwin's, Prehistoric Nations, page 291. The Egyptians placed Dionysus, Osiris, at the close of the period of their history which was assigned to the gods, that is, toward the close of the great empire of Atlantis. When we remember that the hymns of the Rig Veda, are admitted to date back to a vast antiquity, and are written in a language that had ceased to be a living tongue thousands of years ago. We can almost fancy those hymns preserve some part of the songs of praise uttered of old upon the island of Atlantis. Many of them seem to belong to sun worship, and might have been sung with propriety upon the high places of Peru. In the beginning there arose the golden child. He was the one born lord of all that is. He established the earth and the sky. Who is the god to whom we shall offer sacrifice? He who gives life, he who gives strength whose command all the bright gods, the stars. Revere, whose light is immortality, whose shadow is death. He who through his power is the one god of the breathing and awakening world. He who governs all, man and beast. He whose greatness these snowy mountains, whose greatness the sea proclaims, with the distant river. He through whom the sky is bright and the earth firm. 
he who measured out the light in the air. Wherever the mighty water clouds went, where they placed the seed and lit the fire, thence arose he who is the sole life of the bright gods. He to whom heaven and earth, standing firm by his will, look up, trembling inwardly. May he not destroy us, he, the creator of the earth, he, the righteous, who created heaven. He also created the bright and mighty waters. This is plainly a hymn to the sun, or to a God whose most glorious representative was the sun. It is the hymn of a people near the sea, it was not written by a people living in the heart of Asia. It was the hymn of a people living in a volcanic country, who call upon their God to keep the earth firm and not to destroy them. It was sung at daybreak, as the sun rolled up the sky over an awakening world. The fire, Agni, upon the altar was regarded as a messenger rising from the earth to the sun. Youngest of the gods, their messenger, their invoker. For thou, O sage, goest wisely between these two creations, heaven and earth, God and man, like a friendly messenger between two hamlets. The dawn of the day, Ushas, part of the sun worship, became also a god. She shines upon us like a young wife, rousing every living being to go to his work. When the fire had to be kindled by man, she made the light by striking down the darkness. As the Egyptians and the Greeks looked to a happy abode, an underworld, in the west, beyond the waters, so the Aryan's paradise was the other side of some body of water. In the Veda, 7. 56, 24, we find a prayer to the Maruts, the storm gods, O, Maruts, may there be to us a strong sun, who is a living ruler of men, through whom we may cross the waters on our way to the happy abode. This happy abode is described as, where King Vivasvata reigns, where the secret place of heaven is, where the mighty waters are, where there is food and rejoicing, where there is happiness and delight, where joy and pleasure reside. Rig Veda 9. 1 13, 7. This is the paradise beyond the seas, the Elysian, the Elysian fields of the Greek and the Egyptian, located upon an island in the Atlantic which was destroyed by water. One great chain of tradition binds together these widely separated races. The religion of the Veda knows no idols, says Max Muller. The worship of idols in India is a secondary formation, a degradation of the more primitive worship of ideal gods. It was pure sun worship, such as prevailed in Peru on the arrival of the Spaniards. It accords with Plato's description of the religion of Atlantis. The Dolphin's Ridge, at the bottom of the Atlantic, or the high land revealed by the soundings taken by the ship Challenger, is, as will be seen, of a three-pronged form one prong pointing toward the west coast of Ireland. Another connecting with the northeast coast of South America, and a third near or on the west coast of Africa. It does not follow that the island of Atlantis, at any time while inhabited by civilized people, actually reached these coasts. There is a strong probability that races of men may have found their way there from the three continents of Europe, America, and Africa. Or the great continent which once filled the whole bed of the present Atlantic Ocean, and from whose debris geology tells us the old and new worlds were constructed, may have been the scene of the development, during immense periods of time. Of diverse races of men, occupying different zones of climate. There are many indications that there were three races of men dwelling on Atlantis. Noah, according to Genesis, had three sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth who represented three different races of men of different colors. The Greek legends tell us of the rebellions inaugurated at different times in Olympus. One of these was a rebellion of the giants, a race of beings sprung from the blood of Uranus, the great original progenitor of the stock. Their king or leader was Porphyrian, their most powerful champion Alcyonius. Their mother was the earth, this probably meant that they represented the common people of a darker line. They made a desperate struggle for supremacy, but were conquered by Zeus. There were also two rebellions of the Titans. The Titans seem to have had a government of their own, and the names of twelve of their kings are given in the Greek mythology, see Murray, page 27. They also were of, the blood of Uranus, the Adam of the people. We read, in fact, that Uranus married Gia, the earth, and had three families, one, the Titans, two, the Hecatonchires, and three, the Kyclopes.
we should conclude that the last two were maritime peoples, and I have shown that their mythical characteristics were probably derived from the appearance of their ships. Here we have, I think, a reference to the three races, one, the red or sunburnt men, like the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Basques, and the Berber and Kushite stocks, two, the sons of Shem, possibly the yellow or Turanian race. And three, the whiter men, the Aryans, the Greeks, Celts, Goths, Slavs, etc. If this view is correct, then we may suppose that colonies of the pale-faced stock may have been sent out from Atlantis to the northern coasts of Europe at different and perhaps widely separated periods of time, from some of which the Aryan families of Europe proceeded. Hence the legend, which is found among them, that they were once forced to dwell in a country where the summers were only two months long. From the earliest times two grand divisions are recognized in the Aryan family, to the east those who specially called themselves Aryans, whose descendants inhabited Persia, India, etc. To the west, the Yavna, or the young ones, who first emigrated westward, and from whom have descended the various nations that have populated Europe. This is the name, Javan, found in the tenth chapter of Genesis. Lenormand and Chevalier, Ancient History of the East, Volume 2, Page 2. But surely those who first emigrated westward, the earliest to leave the parent stock, could not be the young ones, they would be rather the elder brothers. But if we can suppose the Bactrian population to have left Atlantis at an early date, and the Greeks, Latins, and Celts to have left it at a later period, then they would indeed be the young ones of the family. Following on the heels of the earlier migrations, and herein we would find the explanation of the resemblance between the Latin and Celtic tongues. Lenormand says the name of Aaron, Ireland, is derived from Arian, and yet we have seen this island populated and named Aaron by races distinctly. Connected with Spain, Iberia, Africa, and Atlantis. There is another reason for supposing that the Aryan nations came from Atlantis. We find all Europe, except a small corner of Spain and a strip along the Arctic Circle, occupied by nations recognized as Aryan. But when we turn to Asia, there is but a corner of it, and that corner in the part nearest Europe, occupied by the Aryans. All the rest of that great continent has been filled from immemorial ages by non-Aryan races. There are seven branches of the Aryan family, one, Germanic or Teutonic, two, Slavo-Lithuanic, three, Celtic, 4, Italic, 5, Greek, 6, Iranian or Persian, 7, Sanskritic or Indian. And of these seven branches five dwell on the soil of Europe, and the other two are intrusive races in Asia from the direction of Europe. The Aryans in Europe have dwelt there apparently since the close of the Stone Age, if not before it, while the movements of the Aryans in Asia are within the historical period, and they appear as intrusive stocks forming a high caste amid a vast population of a different race. The Vedas are supposed to date back to 2000 BC, while there is every reason to believe that the Celt inhabited Western Europe 1500 BC. If the Aryan race had originated in the heart of Asia, why would not its ramifications have extended into Siberia, China, and Japan, and all over Asia? And if the Aryans moved at a comparatively recent date into Europe from Bactria, where are the populations that then inhabited Europe the men of the ages of stone and bronze? We should expect to find the western coasts of Europe filled with them, just as the eastern coasts of Asia and India are filled with Turanian populations. On the contrary, we know that the Aryans descended upon India from the Punjab, which lies to the northwest of that region, and that their traditions represent that they came there from the west, to wit, from the direction of Europe and Atlantis. 11. Atlantis Reconstructed The farther we go back in time toward the era of Atlantis, the more the evidences multiply that we are approaching the presence of a great, wise, civilized race. For instance, we find the Egyptians, Ethiopians, and Israelites, from the earliest ages, refusing to eat the flesh of swine. The Western nations departed from this rule, and in these modern days we are beginning to realize the dangers of this article of food, on account of the trachina contained in it. And when we turn to the Talmud, we are told that it was forbidden to the Jews, because of a small insect which infests it. 
the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Phoenicians, the Hebrews, and others of the ancient races, practiced circumcision. It was probably resorted to in Atlantean days, and imposed as a religious duty, to arrest one of the most dreadful scourges of the human race a scourge which continued to decimate the people of America, arrested their growth. And paralyzed their civilization. Circumcision stamped out the disease in Atlantis, we read of one Atlantean king, the Greek god Aurenas, who, in a time of plague, compelled his whole army and the armies of his allies to undergo the rite. The colonies that went out to Europe carried the practice but not the disease out of which it originated with them. And it was not until Columbus reopened communication with the infected people of the West India Islands that the scourge crossed the Atlantic and turned Europe, as one has expressed it, into a charnel house. Life insurance statistics show, nowadays, that the average life and health of the Hebrew is much greater than that of other men. And he owes this to the retention of practices and beliefs imposed 10,000 years ago by the great, wise race of Atlantis. Let us now, with all the facts before us, glean from various sources, reconstruct, as near as may be, the condition of the antediluvians. They dwelt upon a great island, near which were other smaller islands, probably east and west of them, forming stepping stones, as it were, toward Europe and Africa in one direction, and the West India Islands and America in the other. There were volcanic mountains upon the main island, rising to a height of 1500 feet, with their tops covered with perpetual snow. Below these were elevated tablelands, upon which were the royal establishments. Below these, again, was, the Great Plain of Atlantis. There were four rivers flowing north, south, east, and west from a central point. The climate was like that of the Azores, mild and pleasant. The soil volcanic and fertile, and suitable at its different elevations for the growth of the productions of the tropical and temperate zones. The people represented at least two different races, a dark brown reddish race, akin to the Central Americans, the Berbers, and the Egyptians, and a white race, like the Greeks, Goths, Celts, and Scandinavians. Various battles and struggles followed between the different peoples for supremacy. The darker race seems to have been, physically, a smaller race, with small hands. The lighter colored race was much larger hence the legends of the Titans and Giants. The Guanches of the Canary Islands were men of very great stature. As the works of the Bronze Age represent a small-handed race, and as the races who possessed the ships and gunpowder joined in the war against the Giants, we might conclude that the dark races were the more civilized. That they were the metalworkers and navigators. The fact that the same opinions and customs exist on both sides of the ocean implies identity of origin. It might be argued that the fact that the explanation of many customs existing on both hemispheres is to be found only in America, implies that the primeval stock existed in America, the emigrating portion of the population carrying away the custom. But forgetting the reason for it. The fact that domestic cattle and the great cereals, wheat, oats, barley, and rye, are found in Europe and not in America, would imply that after population moved to Atlantis from America civilization was developed in Atlantis. And that in the later ages communication was closer and more constant between Atlantis and Europe than between Atlantis and America. In the case of the bulky domestic animals, it would be more difficult to transport them, in the open vessels of that day, from Atlantis across the wider expanse of sea to America then it would be to carry them by way of the now submerged islands in front of the Mediterranean Sea to the coast of Spain. It may be, too, that the climate of Spain and Italy was better adapted to the growth of wheat, barley, oats and rye, than maize. While the drier atmosphere of America was better suited to the latter plant even now comparatively little wheat or barley is raised in Central America, Mexico, or Peru, and none on the low coasts of those countries. While a smaller quantity of maize, proportionately, is grown in Italy, Spain, and the rest of Western Europe, the rainy climate being unsuited to it. We have seen, p. 60, anti, that there is reason to believe that maize was known in a remote period in the drier regions of the Egyptians and Chinese. As science has been able to reconstruct the history of the migrations of the Aryan race, 
by the words that exist or fail to appear in the kindred branches of that tongue, so the time will come when a careful comparison of words, customs, opinions. Arts existing on the opposite sides of the Atlantic will furnish an approximate sketch of Atlantean history. The people had attained a high position as agriculturists. The presence of the plough in Egypt and Peru implies that they possessed that implement. And as the horns and ox head of Baal show the esteem in which cattle were held among them, we may suppose that they had passed the stage in which the plough was drawn by men, as in Peru and Egypt in ancient times. And in Sweden during the historical period, and that it was drawn by oxen or horses. They first domesticated the horse, hence the association of Poseidon or Neptune, a sea god, with horses, hence the racecourses for horses described by Plato. They possessed sheep, and manufactured woolen goods. They also had goats, dogs, and swine. They raised cotton and made cotton goods, they probably cultivated maize, wheat, oats, barley, rye, tobacco, hemp, and flax, and possibly potatoes, they built aqueducts and practiced irrigation. They were architects, sculptors, and engravers, they possessed an alphabet, they worked in tin, copper, bronze, silver, gold, and iron. During the vast period of their duration, as peace and agriculture caused their population to increase to overflowing, they spread out in colonies east and west to the ends of the earth. This was not the work of a few years, but of many centuries. And the relations between these colonies may have been something like the relation between the different colonies that in a later age were established by the Phoenicians, the Greeks, and the Romans. There was an intermingling with the more ancient races, the autochthonies of the different lands where they settled. And the same crossing of stocks, which we know to have been continued all through the historical period, must have been going on for thousands of years, whereby new races and new dialects were formed. And the result of all this has been that the smaller races of antiquity have grown larger, while all the complexions shade into each other, so that we can pass from the whitest to the darkest by insensible degrees. In some respects the Atlanteans exhibited conditions similar to those of the British islands, there were the same, and even greater, race differences in the population, the same plantation of colonies in Europe, Asia, and America. The same carrying of civilization to the ends of the earth. We have seen colonies from Great Britain going out in the 3rd and 5th centuries to settle on the shores of France, in Brittany, representing one of the nationalities and languages of the mother country a race Atlantean in origin. In the same way we may suppose Hamitic emigrations to have gone out from Atlantis to Syria, Egypt, and the Barbary states. If we could imagine Highland Scotch, Welsh, Cornish, and Irish populations emigrating en masse from England in later times, and carrying to their new lands the civilization of England, with peculiar languages not English. We would have a state of things probably more like the migrations which took place from Atlantis. England, with a civilization Atlantean in origin, peopled by races from the same source, is repeating in these modern times the empire of Zeus and Kronos. And, just as we have seen Troy, Egypt, and Greece warring against the parent race, so in later days we have seen Brittany and the United States separating themselves from England. The race characteristics remaining after the governmental connection had ceased. In religion the Atlanteans had reached all the great thoughts which underlie our modern creeds. They had attained to the conception of one universal, omnipotent, great first cause. We find the worship of this one God in Peru and in early Egypt. They looked upon the sun as the mighty emblem, type, and instrumentality of this one God. Such a conception could only have come with civilization. It is not until these later days that science has realized the utter dependence of all earthly life upon the sun's rays. All applications of animal power may be regarded as derived directly or indirectly from the static chemical power of the vegetable substance by which the various organisms and their capabilities are sustained. And this power, in turn, from the kinetic action of the sun's rays. Winds and ocean currents, hailstorms and rain, sliding glaciers, flowing rivers, and falling cascades are the direct offspring of solar heat. All our machinery, therefore, whether driven by the windmill or the water wheel, by horsepower, or by steam all the results of electrical and electromagnetic changes are telegraphs, our clocks, and our watches. 
all are wound up primarily by the sun. The sun is the great source of energy in almost all terrestrial phenomena. From the meteorological to the geographical, from the geological to the biological, in the expenditure and conversion of molecular movements, derived from the sun's rays, must be sought the motive power of all this infinitely varied phantasmagoria. But the people of Atlantis had gone farther, they believed that the soul of man was immortal, and that he would live again in his material body, in other words, they believed in, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. They accordingly embalmed their dead. The Duke of Argyle, the Unity of Nature, says. We have found in the most ancient records of the Aryan language proof that the indications of religious thought are higher, simpler, and purer as we go back in time, until at last. In the very oldest compositions of human speech which have come down to us, we find the divine being spoken of in the sublime language which forms the opening of the Lord's Prayer. The date in absolute chronology of the oldest Vedic literature does not seem to be known. Professor Max Muller, however, considers that it may possibly take us back 5,000 years. All we can see with certainty is that the earliest inventions of mankind are the most wonderful that the race has ever made. The first use of fire, and the discovery of the methods by which it can be kindled, the domestication of wild animals. And, above all, the processes by which the various cereals were first developed out of some wild grasses these are all discoveries with which, in ingenuity and in importance, no subsequent discoveries may compare. They are all unknown to history all lost in the light of an effulgent dawn. The Atlanteans possessed an established order of priests, their religious worship was pure and simple. They lived under a kingly government. They had their courts, their judges, their records, their monuments covered with inscriptions, their mines, their foundries, their workshops, their looms, their grist mills, their boats and sailing vessels, their highways, aqueducts, wharves, docks, and canals. They had processions, banners, and triumphal arches for their kings and heroes, they built pyramids, temples, round towers, and obelisks, they practiced religious ablutions, they knew the use of the magnet and of gunpowder. In short, they were in the enjoyment of a civilization nearly as high as our own, lacking only the printing press, and those inventions in which steam, electricity, and magnetism are used. We are told that Devanahusha visited his colonies in farther India. An empire which reached from the Andes to Hindustan, if not to China, must have been magnificent indeed. In, its markets must have met the maze of the Mississippi Valley, the copper of Lake Superior, the gold and silver of Peru and Mexico, the spices of India, the tin of Wales and Cornwall, the bronze of Iberia, the amber of the Baltic, the wheat and barley of Greece, Italy, and Switzerland. It is not surprising that when this mighty nation sank beneath the waves, in the midst of terrible convulsions, with all its millions of people, the event left an everlasting impression upon the imagination of mankind. Let us suppose that Great Britain should tomorrow meet with a similar fate. What a wild consternation would fall upon her colonies and upon the whole human family. The world might relapse into barbarism, deep and almost universal. William the Conqueror, Richard Kerr de Lyon, Alfred the Great, Cromwell, and Victoria might survive only as the gods or demons of later races. But the memory of the cataclysm in which the center of a universal empire instantaneously went down to death would never be forgotten, it would survive in fragments, more or less complete, in every land on earth. It would outlive the memory of a thousand lesser convulsions of nature, it would survive dynasties, nations, creeds, and languages, it would never be forgotten while man continued to inhabit the face of the globe. Science has but commenced its work of reconstructing the past and rehabilitating the ancient peoples, and surely there is no study which appeals more strongly to the imagination than that of this drowned nation, the true antediluvians. They were the founders of nearly all our arts and sciences, they were the parents of our fundamental beliefs, they were the first civilizers, the first navigators, the first merchants, the first colonizers of the earth. Their civilization was old when Egypt was young, and they had passed away thousands of years before Babylon, Rome, or London were dreamed of. This lost people were our ancestors, their blood flows in our veins. 
The words we use every day were heard, in their primitive form, in their cities, courts, and temples. Every line of race and thought, of blood and belief, leads back to them. Nor is it impossible that the nations of the earth may yet employ their idle navies in bringing to the light of day some of the relies of this buried people. Portions of the island lie but a few hundred fathoms beneath the sea. And if expeditions have been sent out from time to time in the past, to resurrect from the depths of the ocean sunken treasure ships with a few thousand doubloons bidden in their cabins, why should not an attempt be made to reach the buried wonders of Atlantis? A single engraved tablet dredged up from Plato's island would be worth more to science, would more strike the imagination of mankind, than all the gold of Peru, all the monuments of Egypt, and all the terracotta fragments gathered from the great libraries of Chaldea. May not the so-called Phoenician coins found on Corvo, one of the Azores, be of Atlantean origin? Is it probable that that great race, preeminent as a founder of colonies, could have visited those islands within the historical period, and have left them unpeopled, as they were when discovered by the Portuguese? We are but beginning to understand the past, one hundred years ago the world knew nothing of Pompeii or Herculaneum, nothing of the lingual tie that binds together the Indo-European nations. Nothing of the significance of the vast volume of inscriptions upon the tombs and temples of Egypt, nothing of the meaning of the arrow-headed inscriptions of Babylon. Nothing of the marvelous civilizations revealed in the remains of Yucatan, Mexico, and Peru. We are on the threshold. Scientific investigation is advancing with giant strides. Who shall say that one hundred years from now the great museums of the world may not be adorned with gems, statues, arms, and implements from Atlantis, while the libraries of the world shall contain translations of its inscriptions? Throwing new light upon all the past history of the human race, and all the great problems which now perplex the thinkers of our day. The End